What is going on guys? So last summer I built the shed you're seeing behind me. This video is gonna go through every single step of the shed construction process from start to finish. Now, the first couple minutes of this video is just gonna be a time lapse of the entire shed construction process. I recommend that you watch that first to make sure that what I'm doing is something that you wanna replicate. I'm gonna have chapter markers at the bottom of the video so you can skip around to the individual sections and the different parts of the construction process. I hope you enjoy it, I hope it helps you out, and with that being said, let's get into the video.
What is up everybody? So in this episode of the Modern Shed Build series, we're going to be talking about a few of the most common shed foundation options so that you have a sturdy base to build your shed upon. Let's get into it. So here's a look at my old shed and I got lucky because there's already a 10 by 10 concrete slab beneath it. So all we had to do was demolish our old shed so we could build our new one. For those who like demolition, here's a 10 second time lapse of the demo process. So after demolishing the old shed, we were left with this 10 by 10 concrete slab, which after inspection looked to be in really good shape. So after a quick power wash, we were basically all ready to start building our new shed. Now, although I was fortunate to have an existing slab, I understand that most of you are going to be building your new shed foundation from scratch. So I wanted to talk about two of the most common shed foundation options, which are the concrete slab like I had and the gravel shed foundation, which a lot of people also use. We'll also brush over a few of the less common but still acceptable shed foundation options, but let's get into it. Although I've never poured a concrete shed foundation, I have extended a concrete patio and the steps are pretty similar. So basically for all of these concrete foundations, you're gonna have a gravel layer, which is usually three to six inches, and then a concrete slab layer on top, which can be anywhere from four to six inches. You're also gonna wanna reinforce that slab with either mesh or rebar, but we'll talk more about reinforcement in a minute. One other thing to note is that some people will also install a vapor and moisture barrier before they put in any gravel or anything. So something to think about when planning for your concrete slab. So the first thing you wanna do is plan your layout and for a 10 by 10 slab like we had, I would recommend excavating an 11 by 11 foot square. So you have a little bit of room to install the forms. After excavating around eight inches for four inches of gravel and four inches of concrete, you're gonna come compact the soil and then grab some 57 stone for the four inches of gravel sub base. After we got all of the gravel into the excavated area, we then compacted that similar to how we did for the soil. Next, you're gonna need to actually assemble the forms for your concrete slab. Here we're using one by sixes and we're anchoring them with stakes. And basically this is gonna make the outline and perimeter for your slab. In our case, it would be a 10 by 10 perimeter form. Use a level to make sure that your forms are level all the way across. If you have a large slab, you might want to think about doing something with drainage, maybe crown the slab, but in our case, it's not a big deal since we are going to have that covered by a shed, obviously. Now for this patio extension, we use steel mesh as reinforcement, and if I was doing a 10 by 10 slab, I would probably do the steel mesh again. Since it's a small surface area, I think rebar might be overkill. But do your own research and use reinforcement as you find it necessary. Now in terms of the actual concrete, you can do a dry mix with bags, or you can have it delivered. I use this concrete calculator to determine if you had a 10 by 10 slab, which is 100 square feet at four inches, you would need roughly 56 bags of 80 pound concrete mix. So for my patio extension, I actually did mix my concrete by hand and it was right around 85 bags. It was a lot of work. We rented this mixer and although you can do it, it is very labor intensive and it was a lot of work. So I think I would recommend if you are going to go this route in building your own concrete slab for your shed to have it delivered by a concrete truck. But in our case, we did it by hand. So we continued to dump the concrete mix until we filled up the entire form area. Then at that point, you're gonna use a piece of lumber or similar to screed the top surface and add in any additional concrete to fill in holes. And then once you've screeded it off and gotten it roughly level, you're gonna take a bull float and a hand trowel to finish the concrete surface and make sure that it's perfectly smooth all the way across. An optional step is to use an edging trowel to give you rounded corners around the perimeter of the slab. Now, I'm not gonna to pretend to be an expert on building a concrete shed foundation because I'm not. So in the description, I'm gonna link a few videos that I think explain the process really well if you do wanna go with the concrete slab for your shed foundation. Now that we've talked about the concrete slab option for a foundation, let's talk about the gravel shed foundation, which is also very common. So for your gravel shed foundation, you wanna plan out exactly where you're gonna position it in your yard. You wanna pick a spot that's relatively flat so you're not dealing with a big slope. And you also wanna find a place that has good drainage. Now to construct a gravel shed foundation, you're essentially going to create a border with 4x4, 4x6, or 6x6 pressure treated lumber. It needs to be pressure treated because it will be exposed to moisture over the lifetime of the shed. So basically you're just going to create a frame and then fill up the inside of that frame with a minimum of 4 inches of gravel. Another rule of thumb is you want to have your gravel shed foundation about two foot wider than the actual shed. So here we have a 10 by 10 foot shed. So you want to have a 12 by 12 foot gravel foundation so that you have sufficient support for the shed. So after building the frame, checking to make sure it's level and securing all the pieces together, 
You're going to want to install a geotextile fabric at the base of the shed foundation. Then you're going to grab some 57 stone and install it on top of that. So it goes earth, geotextile fabric, and then 57 stone on top of that. So you're going to continue to fill up the gravel shed foundation base with as much 57 stone as it takes to get a minimum of four inches all the way across. After getting your stone level, do some compaction and then you're ready to install the shed. Now, just like for the concrete slab foundation, I'm not an expert on the gravel shed foundation either, so I'm gonna leave a link down below for a video that goes through the entire gravel shed base construction process, step by step. Now, although the concrete slab and the gravel shed foundation are the most common, and in my opinion, the most reliable of the shed foundations, there are a few others that are a little less common that we'll go into here in a very brief kind of way. So first, let's talk about the concrete deck blocks and also the plastic deck blocks that you've probably seen people build small sheds upon. So basically you would just kind of take your two by four or two by six lumber and you would insert it into these blocks and you would basically just create the frame, put a few intermediate members in between and then you could build your shed upon them. These are okay, they're not the best option, but they are feasible for small sheds where you don't really care too much and there's a little bit of settling over time. There's also some people who would just build a shed on top of literally some pavers they put down and then they'll build the shed base directly on top of those. And these last three options you're seeing here are very uncommon, so I'm not gonna cover those in the video. So check those out on your own if you're interested in those alternate shed foundation options. Fortunately for me, I had an existing concrete shed foundation, so in the next video, I'm gonna show you how I built the shed base, and I'm also gonna show you how I framed the shed walls in the video after that. If you wanna learn exactly how I built this modern shed, you can click the link down in the description. But that's all for me. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. What is up guys? So in this video, we're gonna be building a shed base frame for my modern shed. So without wasting time, let's get into it. Hey guys, so as you saw from the intro, my existing shed had a 10 by 10 concrete slab underneath it. So after demolition, we were all set to build our shed base. If you don't have an existing foundation, you can check out my shed foundation option video, which goes through the concrete slab and the gravel shed foundations, which are the most common. So if you have a concrete slab, you can actually frame your shed walls directly on that. And to do that, you would simply use a masonry bit to pre-drill through your bottom plate and then use a Tapcon screw to secure the bottom plate to the concrete shed foundation. This is the same process you would use for a basement wall. But in my case, I wanted to give a little bit more separation between the slab and my shed just because I have clay soils and I didn't want to deal with moisture. So if we hop into the 3D model real quick, we'll take a look at the shed base and I have a 2x4x10 as the end cap there and a 2x4x10 at the bottom on the other side as well. And then we have our 4x4 floor joists. And although this example uses 4x4s as floor joists, there are other ways to do it with 2x4s or 2x6s, so spend a little time doing your own due diligence. And if you flip over to the top here, you can see that we're using 4 foot by 8 foot sheets of plywood as the shed subfloor. And this is where you're going to need to start planning out your floor joist spacing. So in our case, we have 4 foot by 8 foot sheets. So you want to position your floor joists so that the end of a 4x8 sheet of plywood will land directly in the center of your floor joists. So I just peeled away one piece there and I can show you here that the plywood arrangement is going to land directly in the center of the floor joist. So based on your shed size, you're going to want to spend some time planning out your floor joist spacing so that the edge of each piece of plywood is going to land directly in the center of a floor joist so that it's supported. If you're using three quarter inch plywood like me, the maximum floor joist spacing is 24 inches. For this 10 by 10 shed, I needed seven four by four by tens for the floor joist and I needed two two by four by tens for the end caps. So we have all of our four by fours and we're going to cut each one of them to nine foot, nine inches. So as you just heard, we're gonna go ahead and measure each of our four by fours to a length of nine foot, nine inches. And once we have that mark, we will go ahead and transpose that onto each four by four with a pencil. Then we'll cut those with a miter saw or a circular saw. So here I am cutting the very first four by four by 10 to nine foot, nine inches to be the first floor joist. And then I'm gonna repeat this for the other six floor joists. Again, cutting each one to nine foot, nine inches long. After cutting all of the seven 4x4x10s to 9 foot 9 inches, we're going to go ahead and cut our end caps, which are 2x4s, to a length of 10 feet. Okay, so at this point we have our 2x4x10 foot. If we go over here, it's probably going to be just a hair over 10 feet. Uh, most of them are, so we're going to trim it now to get an even 10 feet. Just making the mark right there at 10. Okay. 
After cutting the first 2x4x10 by by end cap to an even 10 feet, repeat that for the second end cap. Again, marking 10 feet and trimming off as necessary. At this point, all of the shed base frame components have been cut to size and we can start the assembly process. Now to actually assemble the shed base, I recommend that you take both of your 2x4x10s by by that are going to be the end caps, make sure they're crown up, and then use clamps to actually clamp them together so that they're perfectly in line. Then, based on the floor joist spacing that you determine during the planning stage to make sure that your plywood is going to land directly in the center of a floor joist, you're going to go ahead and you're going to mark the end caps all the way across. Now, because this lumber was pressure treated, the pen and pencil I was trying to use to mark didn't work so well, so I switched over to a Sharpie, but the process is pretty similar. You're going to go down the length of the end caps and you're going to mark the location of each floor joist. After marking the locations for each of the seven floor joists for my 10 by 10 shed, it's time to start assembling the shed base frame. So as you can see, I'm taking the front face of the shed, I'm taking the end cap and I'm positioning it on the edge of the slab. And here I am taking the end cap for the back and putting it in place. And then I'm pulling in my floor joist and preliminarily placing them. Okay, so at this point we have our frame. Let's just take a quick look at it. It's all assembled like this. We have our marks. So we have the end there, we have that, we have that. We have that, we have all of these aligned right there as we measured, then we have it on the end there. And then we obviously have it on the other side as well. So we have it there, see our mark, we have it all lined up on the inside, the inside, right there on the inside, the inside, inside all the way to the end. So the next step is just to screw it all together and we'll do that right now. Once the shed base frame has been laid out, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your three inch exterior rated screws and you're gonna screw through the end cap into each of the floor joists. So what he's doing right now is he's making sure everything is flush on the same plane. Use two screws per connection as you're seeing here. Although three inches works fine, if you wanna go three and a half inches, that's fine as well. I just recommend that you use two screws at each connection point. Some people might argue that nails are also fine as long as they're galvanized and rated for exterior use. And I would say that's fine, but I would go with screws since they're just a little bit more secure. And because this is a base, we want to start with a nice firm foundation. So after finishing with the front end cap and attaching that to the floor joist, we're moving on to the back end and doing the exact same thing. After securing each connection with screws, you want to make sure that the shed base frame is perfectly square. And to do this, you're going to measure the opposite corner diagonal measurements, and you want to make sure that those are equal. Make any adjustments as needed to get those measurements perfectly equal across opposite corners. If you live in a high wind area or if local code requires, you may need to secure your shed base frame directly to the concrete slab below. To anchor the base frame to the slab, I recommend you install a piece of 2 inch by 4 inch blocking between the joists as shown. Then use a carbide tip masonry bit to drill through the piece of blocking and into the concrete slab. Next, take a 3 inch Tapcon screw and screw through the piece of blocking and directly into the concrete slab, securing your shed base frame to the concrete below. I did this in two locations. At this point, it's time to install the 3 quarter inch pressure treated plywood deck. For this 10 by 10 shed, we're going to need two full 4 foot by 8 foot sheets of pressure treated plywood and then four partial sheets. Let's start with the full sheets of plywood first. Get them positioned so the sheets of plywood are flush with the end cap and also the floor joist on the outermost part of the shed base frame. This is going to require a little bit of back and forth until you're perfectly happy with how everything looks. Okay, so as you can see, when it's perfectly flush with this side, it's going to land you right in the middle. And it's also flush on the front face. And here I am showing you that the spacing for the floor joist allows a piece of plywood to land directly in the center of a floor joist. And once you have the first full sheet of plywood in place, go ahead and use 1.5 inch exterior screws and install those into each floor joist every 12 inches or so on center. Here I am taking the second full sheet of plywood. And as you can see, I'm doing a bit of a stagger there. Again, make sure that the outside edge of the plywood is flush with the floor joist there. So again, you'll see it's flush with the end here and that puts us right in the center of this four x four for anchoring. So after installing the first two full sheets of four foot by eight foot plywood, you're gonna have to go and measure your partial sheets. So what I just did there is I used a chalk line to establish where I would need to cut this piece of plywood so that it fits in the corner. And after field verifying that it fit right, I used one and a half inch exterior rated screws to secure it in place. And at this point, you're gonna continue to measure and cut your partial sheets to length. I recommend that you use obviously a tape measure and a chalk line to make even cuts. 
And if you want access to the exact partial cut dimensions I needed to build this 10 by 10 shed base frame, you can check out the link in the description. Here I am filling in the final two partial cuts and securing it with one and a half inch screws into the floor joist below. Another helpful tip is you can use a chalk line to mark the joist location. That way, if you miss any of the one and a half inch screws to secure the plywood to the floor joist below, you can go back later and make sure that all of your screws are gonna actually contact a floor joist. And at this point, your shed base frame is complete. In the next video, I'm gonna be showing you exactly how to frame the modern shed walls. So definitely subscribe if you don't wanna miss those videos. And as a quick reminder, if you want the exact step-by-step -step process I use to build this modern shed, you can check the link in the description. What is up guys? So this video is gonna tell you how to frame the walls for the modern shed you just saw. It's gonna run through how to actually lay out the wall and position your wall studs. It'll show you how to lift the walls into place. And it'll also go through a bunch of tips and tricks for a successful shed wall framing installation. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. So today's video is all about the shed walls, but in my last video, I went through actually how to frame the shed base. So if you still need a base, you can check out that video. I'll link it in the description. So this lean to modern shed will obviously have four walls. The front wall is the most complicated with the headers. The side walls have the window rough and openings and the back wall is pretty standard. Let's start with the back wall because it's the simplest. Shed walls are almost always gonna be framed with two by fours. And as you can see, we have a two by four at the top, which is the top plate, a two by four at the bottom, which is the bottom plate. And all of the vertical pieces of lumber in between the top and bottom plate are called the studs. When determining your stud spacing and also the overall height of the wall, you wanna consider the type of siding you're gonna be using. In this case, we're using T111 or LP Smart Siding, and we wanna make sure that our studs are placed so they're in between the two adjacent sections of siding, and we want the height to be appropriate as well. So spend some time planning your layout. So planning out your stud spacing as well as just the overall layout of the shed is usually the most time consuming part of building your own shed, which is why I put together the shed build course down in the description. So if you wanna know exactly what dimensions and stud spacing I use for this modern shed, you can check that link in the description. Now at this point, I have all of the wall studs for the back wall laid out, and now I'm gonna cut them to the appropriate height. In this case, that's seven feet, eight and five sixteenths inches. We're gonna go ahead and mark this for all the studs, marking it with a pen and a carpenter square and then cutting it with a miter saw. Repeat this for all the studs for your back wall. I'm gonna need safety, tell the op can't snake it. Ray gun on safety. So after cutting the top plate, bottom plate, and all the wall studs to length, what you're gonna do is clamp the top plate and bottom plate together. And the reason we're doing this is that it's gonna allow us to mark the stud locations on the top plate and bottom plate at the same time. Now, our stud spacing is gonna be based on 16 inch on center spacing. Obviously, we're gonna make a few minor adjustments to ensure that our T111 siding is gonna land in the middle of a stud. So here you can see I have both the top and bottom plate clamped together, and I'm using a tape measure to mark the stud location in accordance with the course plan. So I'm using my tape measure, making the mark for each wall stud. We made our mark everywhere, so we're gonna line up the two by four there, and then obviously it's gonna occupy this space on the right-hand side. So we did that all the way across, got our mark, got our mark, got our mark, got our mark, all the way to the end there. Something you wanna keep in mind when you're framing these walls is the crown of the lumber. The crown of lumber is defined as the slightly upward arching curvature that you observe when looking down a board's narrowest dimensional edge. You wanna make sure that all the wall studs are crowned the same way. So as you can see here, I'm taking the wall studs and I'm sighting down the narrowest edge to confirm the crown. In this case, I wanna have all the studs facing crown up. So my brother and I are making sure that each one is crown up, which we did previously, and then positioning them in place between the top and bottom plate. Okay, so we have our wall preliminarily framed out here. As you can see, we have all of our marks. I'm gonna go to the other side because I think it's a little bit clearer. Um, we have our mark there, our mark there, our mark there. And again, we have these wall studs marked in accordance with the course guide. And then what we're gonna do is take our nail gun and nail two nails into each wall stud through the top and bottom plate as you're seeing. So a few things to keep in mind as you nail the studs into the top and bottom plate in position. One, you wanna make sure that the outermost studs are completely flush with the top plate and bottom plate. And then you also wanna make sure that when you're nailing with a nail gun that you have your hand far enough away that if, God forbid, the nail sticks out, it will never be long enough to contact your hand. Repeat this process for each stud that's part of the back wall. You can use either three inch or three and a half inch exterior rated nails. Just use nails that are compatible with the nail gun that you have. So after attaching each stud in place, my brother and I lift the wall out of place and preliminarily position it, making sure it looks good. And then we're gonna move that out of the way as we go and frame the side walls. 
You do have the option to just stand the wall up immediately by using a 2x4 as a brace. You want to make sure that your wall is perfectly plumb and then you'll go ahead and attach that brace to the wall as well as the shed base frame. But in our case, we're going to stand up the walls later. So after framing the back wall, we're going to move on and we're going to frame the side walls. And because the side walls are completely identical, we're going to frame one and then basically repeat the exact same process for the second side wall. So I'm framing these side walls in accordance with the course guide. And the first step in that is to cut our top and bottom plate to nine feet, five inches. And then our studs again to seven feet, eight and five sixteenths inches, just as was done for the back wall. So here I am grabbing the first two by four by 10 piece of lumber, and I'm gonna mark it right here using a pen and a carpenter square at nine foot five inches. And then we're simply gonna cut our top plate to size using a miter saw. So after cutting the first top plate to uh, nine foot five inches, I'm going and I'm placing it on top of the shed frame base so I can start assembling the layout for the whole sidewall. Here I am taking the bottom plate, and again, I'm gonna mark nine foot five inches and then use the carpenter square to get a straight line and then you'll see, I'll cut it again on the miter saw. After cutting the bottom plate to size, I'm taking it over and I'm gonna place it on top of the shed base across from the top plate that I cut previously. So for efficiency, I also cut the top plate and bottom plate for the second side wall at this point. That way, I would be able to mark the stud spacing for both side walls on the top and bottom plates at the same time. The sidewall stud spacing is based on 16 inch on center convention. So as you can see, I have the top and bottom plate for both side walls, which is four pieces of lumber total. And I am using clamps to hold those together and then using a tape measure to mark the location of each stud. Repeat this process until the location of each stud is marked on the top and bottom plates. Again, you wanna plan out your stud spacing layout so that the edge of each piece of siding is gonna land directly in the center of a stud. So after marking each stud location using my tape measure, I went back with my carpenter square and I just touched up any of the location markings. So I'll make the line, make it very pronounced, and then I'm marking on which side of the line the stud is gonna rest. And that's designated with the X that you're seeing there. So I just repeated this process for each stud, marking the stud location and then indicating which end of the line the stud is actually going to be placed. So after marking all of the stud locations, we're assembling the wall frame and laying it out on top of the shed base. And make sure that you crown all of your lumber to make sure that it's facing the same way. Then we're taking our nail gun just as before and installing two nails through the top plates and bottom plates and into each stud at the locations we marked previously on the top and bottom plates. Once each stud has been nailed, we lifted the wall in place and then moved it out of the way in preparation for framing the second shed wall. We cut all of our studs to length according to the plan previously, as well as the top and bottom plate to nine foot five inches. And here I am showing the side wall and something to note is that we're installing all of the full studs first and we'll go back and frame the window in later. So here we are nailing each stud into place, going through the top and bottom plates with two nails going through both. We repeated this process just like we did for the back wall and the first side wall. Again, have help if you can. Uh, it really helps to have someone make sure that it's flush on both the top and bottom and then nail it into place. And here's a quick time lapse of the rest of the nailing process and keep an eye on safety. Ultimately, safety is your responsibility, but make sure your hands are clear whenever you're nailing and keep your assistant safe. So something important to note here is that the stud spacing for these shed sidewalls is based on a 14 inch by 21 inch window as indicated in the course material. So if you plan on using a bigger or smaller window, you're gonna need to adjust that sidewall stud spacing around the window accordingly. What we're gonna do now is cut out all the components for the window. As you can see, that consists of cripple studs, king studs, the window sill plates, jack studs, the window header, all that stuff. So refer to the course material for that. And I'll also link one of my blogs in the description, which goes over the shed window framing process step by step. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna go ahead and mark our four feet to frame in our windows. And this four feet marking is for the cripple studs at the bottom of the window that are gonna support the sill plate. So I'm cutting two for the first uh, sidewall and then I'll cut another two four foot cripple studs for the second sidewall. So just repeating this process, cutting them at four feet, using one as a template to mark the length for the next one. Then you're gonna cut out the other window components like the jack studs and the sill plate based on the window you're gonna be installing. Then I'm simply using the jack stud I just cut as a template to mark the length of the next two by four. And after I was happy with how everything was lining up flush, I marked the other side and then I'm gonna go ahead and cut that two by four to length so they're exactly identical. 
Once you've cut all of the jack studs, cripple studs, etc. to length, we can go ahead and assemble it in place on the wall. At this stage, take all of your window components and start placing them within your side wall. So here I am taking the four foot cripple studs at the bottom, positioning them adjacent to the full studs. And then I'm taking my sill plate right there, dry fitting to make sure that I'm content with how everything looks. And then I'm taking my 21 and a half inch jack studs and positioning them in place between the window. So then I put in my header and then I'm actually taking the shed window that I purchased previously and making sure that I'm okay with how it lines up within that rough opening. Once I was content with how everything would fit, I took my nail gun and I started nailing the cripple studs into the bottom plate as you're seeing there and also attaching them to the full stud that is right next door, the king stud if you will. Install as many nails as you need in order to be comfortable with how everything is attached to the adjacent piece of lumber. I'm going about every you know eight inches or so. I think more is better than less in this application, but continue to nail everything together. Here I am taking the sill plate and nailing it into the cripple stud below. And then what you'll see in a second is I will take my jack studs and I'll attach them to the side wall studs as you're seeing here. Again, using a bunch of nails to ensure that I have a good secure connection and that these window frames are going to be secure. And then finally, I'm putting in the window header and I'm gonna take my nail gun and attach that into the jack studs below using two nails per connection for that. And then at the top there, you can see I don't have those jack studs or cripple studs rather in there because I'm field verifying to make sure that the plan dimension that I have included is actually gonna be perfect here. In my case it was, but you might have you know an eighth inch discrepancy depending on the compounded error. Here I am cutting them to size and then I'll go ahead and place them within the window's rough opening frame. There I am positioning it and then I'll take my nail gun and hit those a couple times, making sure that it's secure. And once I repeat this process for the other side, I will have a perfectly framed window in one of the shed sidewalls. So as I finish up framing this shed sidewall window, keep in mind that both of the shed sidewalls are 100% identical. So you'll simply need to repeat the exact same process shown in this lesson for the second shed sidewall. After framing the shed sidewalls, we can finally frame the front wall of the shed. Now, as mentioned previously, the front wall is the most complicated because we have the large rough opening for the door as well as the headers above the door and the windows. So with that being said, let's start framing the shed's front wall. So when planning out your front wall, you're obviously going to need a header over the door's rough opening. In our case, we have a six foot wide roll up door that we installed, and you're also going to need a header over the top to distribute the weight over the windows. The wall studs are going to be two by fours and our headers are going to be two by six lumber. Plan out your front wall layout depending on the size of your door and how big your overall shed is going to be. Feel free to use this 3D framing model as the basis for your shed, but if you want the exact dimensions I used, you can check the link in the description. After developing a front wall framing plan based on the length of your door and also the overall length and size of your shed, cut all of your 2x4 studs to length. After cutting all the two by fours, let's put them in place. Because the front wall has so many components, I recommend that you keep track of them by preliminarily placing them on the shed base frame as they will appear on the front wall, or you can label each piece or do a combination. But the moral of the story is make sure you keep track of your cuts and stay organized so that you can arrange your front wall in place on the shed base frame and keep track of everything in an organized fashion. In my opinion, it's easiest to keep track of everything by placing each cut in position as it will appear on the front wall as you make the cut. So after cutting each two by four stud and top plate to length, I cut the two by six inch headers out. To start, I cut the longer nine foot nine inch headers out first on the two by six inch lumber by marking and then making the cut just as before with the miter saw. Note that when you see each header on the section view, you're actually gonna need two boards cut to the exact same length. So here's the first two inch by six inch header board and then I'm gonna cut another one at the exact same length right after this. You can use the first cut as a template to mark the length for the second if you find that's easier. So something to keep in mind as we build these headers is that two by four lumber is actually one and a half inch by three and a half inches. So when we have our wall studs, that's gonna be three and a half inches. And then when we end up cutting our headers and positioning them uh, vertically, they're only gonna be one and a half inch by one and a half inch, which gives us three inches, which is a half inch shorter than the wall stud. So in order to get that extra thickness for the header so that it's uniform all the way across that wall, we're gonna cut a strip of plywood and put it in between both pieces of the header, which will kind of sandwich it in there and that'll give us the full 
uh, three and a half inches we need so it sits flush with the wall. I'll explain it in the field right now. Okay, so we're constructing our header right here, but as you can see, our wall is gonna be this wide, which is, as you can see, three and a half inches. This header is only gonna be just about three inches. So in order to get that extra half an inch, what we're gonna do is cut a piece of plywood and put it in between. So in order to cut that strip, we're gonna take our 1532s inch plywood and we're gonna make a mark at five and a half inches since that is the nominal width of a two by six inch piece of lumber. After marking that five and a half inches, I'm gonna use a chalk line to go ahead and establish that line all the way across. And once I've established that line, I now have my cut reference to cut a five and a half inch strip by eight feet. And as you can see here, I'm simply using a circular saw to cut the five and a half inch strip of plywood all the way across. And because it's a full sheet of plywood, that's gonna be an eight foot long strip. Because we have a nine foot nine inch header, I'm gonna need to get an additional piece of plywood strip cut so that I can complete the entire nine foot nine inch length of header. Here I am marking that again with a chalk line to five and a half inches, and then again taking my circular saw and cutting it right across that reference line to get another strip. So because we have our one eight foot strip, we're gonna need another one foot nine inch strip to get the full nine foot nine inch header length. So I just made that measurement on the other piece of strip I cut and now at this point, I have nine foot nine inches of five and a half inch plywood strip. So here I am taking my two inch by six inch lumber and I'm positioning the piece of pretty much half inch plywood in between. There's the full eight foot long segment and here is the partial segment on the other side. I'm just positioning that in place on top of one piece of the two by six inch header and then I'm taking the other two inch by six inch header placing it on top. And then I used bar clamps to secure everything while I nailed the header together. After nailing through one side of the header, I simply flipped the header over and nailed in the other side to make sure it was perfectly secure. After constructing a larger nine foot nine inch header for the entire front wall of the shed, I moved over and I created the smaller header for over the roll up door. After cutting the first header to six foot six inches, I'm gonna cut the second piece of the header to six foot six inches. And then just as was done before, we're gonna take a strip of plywood and sandwich it in between. Just like we did for the larger nine foot nine inch header. So once we cut all of the shed's front wall components, we wanted to start by actually anchoring the outermost studs. Okay, so we have everything framed up. We're gonna start with the outside frame and get everything tied together, and then we'll work ourselves towards the inside. So we'll start here on the corner, and get everything nailed in place. So as you can see, we used a bar clamp to get all of the studs tied in together, and then we used a nail gun to go ahead and nail through the bottom plate and into the bottom of each of those studs on the outermost side there. So use enough nails, probably two per stud, and use a bar clamp to make sure that everything is flush. Moving on to the top, you can see that we have the header in place there, and we're using a bar clamp to pull everything tight, and then again, using your nail gun, just nail the components together. Be sure to nail each component to the adjacent component to make sure that your front wall is going to be very sturdy. Here I am going through the top plate into the outermost stud, and then I'm going through the top plate into the header, and then I'm toenailing in a few nails from the header into the studs below. And then again, I'm taking some nails and going through the outermost stud into the supporting studs and then moving on to the other side, repeating the exact same process. Again, that's nailing through the bottom plate into each stud, and then my brother right there is putting weight down to make sure we're flush, and we're using the bar clamp too to tie everything together, and then we're gonna move on to the top and do the exact same thing. Again, this is pretty redundant. Use clamps as needed to make sure that everything is flush and lining up as it should, and use a bunch of nails to secure everything in place. You might need to use a hammer to move things around, um, but yeah, just take your time. Make sure you're happy with it before you nail it. Toenail in as necessary, and if you have any nails that are sticking out, be sure to use a hammer to make sure that you hammer them in flush so they're not protruding out and creating an issue when you go to install the siding. After 
anchoring the outermost studs, we started positioning the rough opening for the door. So we're gonna take our six foot by six inch header, position that there, and then as you can see, we have our horizontal two by fours going in there that rest on top of the studs in between. But basically just make sure that your front wall layout is consistent with how you planned it. And then we're taking our nail gun and we're attaching things in place as soon as we get them flush and positioned where they need to be. As you can see here, my brother and I are consulting with our iPad, which has the dimensions and the course plan on it. Okay, so as we do the, uh, the headers here, what we're showing is that from the end here till here is two feet. So we got 24 inches is where we'll anchor this. And then we have six feet for the door header right here, that's six feet. And then we have our other two feet right here. It's a total of 10 feet. So we have our marks. We can go ahead and get this nailed in now. So here I am moving up to the top of the door's rough opening, and again, use nails to attach every stud in place. There you just saw me toenailing in from the header into the studs below, and again, use a hammer if you need to make sure that you have no protruding nails. Here I am going through the 2x4 there into the header below, and you're basically just going to go through, continue to use bar clamps to pull everything flush, and attach everything in place with nails in accordance with the coarse material dimensions. So the last thing we need to do in order to complete the front wall is we need to complete the framing for the three windows that are positioned above the door. So you're gonna cut all your blocking to size. And as you can see there, we put a stop block in on the saw because we're gonna be cutting a lot of the same dimensions. Now, the way you position these cripple studs is gonna depend on how you framed your front wall, but we're consulting with the course plan there. And we're simply gonna nail those in above the door and also space them appropriately for the windows above. So as you can see here, we're spacing the blocking in accordance with the field guide and something I'll note is it's a little bit tricky to actually install the pieces of blocking there because it tends to move around so it's not as critical for ones like this where you can go through that top header and then into the piece of blocking but they might have the tendency to move around on you as you go to hit them with the nail gun so just be safe make sure your hands are clear use a clamp as needed to hold them in place sometimes you might want to use a screw you may need to toenail in from the side in a couple locations but it's gonna be a little bit tricky, but I guarantee you that you can make this work. Just make sure that the pieces of blocking are flush with the header below and then the window header above and toenail them in as needed. Continue to install all of your cripple studs as needed to get your front wall framing plan completed for the windows. <laughs> all right, we got the whole thing finally framed up. So with all the walls framed, now I'll show you how we can lift all the walls into place and install the double top plate to secure them permanently in place along the shed. So when lifting the shed walls into place, I highly recommend that you start with the front wall because it's the heaviest and it's gonna be the most difficult. As you can see, we started to experience some sliding at the bottom there when we tried to lift it. So what I'm doing is I'm putting some temporary screws in, which will act as a stop in the event that we try to lift it and it starts sliding, the base plate there will catch on those screws and prevent the wall from sliding off the shed base frame. After that, I was respecting the weight of this wall, so I brought the dog inside just to protect against any possibility of some catastrophic incident of the wall falling, and then we went back to it. This wall is gonna weigh hundreds of pounds, especially if it hasn't dried out. So get the help of at least one or two people when lifting it. Try not to throw out your back. Definitely get the help you need and lift it into place. As you can see, we're not experiencing any sliding because the front of that wall at the bottom is catching on those screws and then we're just continuing to lift it until we have it perfectly vertical. Once we had it positioned, we did a little bit of shifting to make sure that the wall was completely flush with the edges of the shed base frame. And then you're also gonna wanna check the front of the wall to make sure that's also perfectly flush with the shed base frame. Once you're pretty happy with how it looks, you're gonna put in some temporary screws or nails as I'm doing there, just to preliminarily hold it in place. Now these temporary fasteners will definitely not hold the wall up by itself. What you really should use is a two by four brace that you install along the outermost wall stud and then attach to the shed base frame. I didn't do that here because I had the luxury of a helper who could hold the wall while I got the adjacent wall positioned in place, but I highly recommend that you install that brace if you're doing this alone or even if you have a helper, that really is the correct way to do it. 
So as you can see, I have my brother holding the front wall in place as I get the first side wall positioned. So again, I recommend that you put a two x four brace and install that temporarily to fasten the front wall to the shed base frame. But because we were, I don't know, trying to be macho or something, we tried to do this without it. And it did work out, but it's really not the best way to go. So what you're seeing here is me trying to get the shed side wall completely flush with the shed base frame. And as you can see, I was a little bit worried about hitting the front wall. So I asked my brother to shift over to the opposite side of the front wall while I held it in place. And then I moved back over to the side wall and tried to shimmy it into position. As you can see with his help, it was much easier. After getting it completely flush with the outermost side of the shed base frame, we did some final positioning and made sure we were perfectly happy with where it was positioned. I used a hammer right there to get it perfectly connected to the front wall and making sure it was completely flush before grabbing a bar clamp and temporarily attaching the side wall to the front wall in preparation for fastening. I used a couple screws to secure the side wall bottom plate to the shed base frame. And then again, we have the bar clamp connecting the two walls, which kind of helped to hold it in position preliminarily. With that done, I grabbed the second side wall and prepared to position it in place on top of the shed base frame. So as you can see, this isn't the easiest of processes to do by yourself, but lifting it into place wasn't too bad. It's just the shifting it and moving it along the shed base frame that's kind of cumbersome. But after a couple iterations, I got it pretty close to where it needed to be. My brother shifted over to the side that we were working on, and then I pushed it into place to get it perfectly flush with the front wall of the shed. Again, you're gonna confirm that it's flush on the side of the shed base frame as well. So after a couple iterations of that, we grabbed a bar clamp and we secured it temporarily just like we did on the other side of the shed. And then as you can see here, I'm using a post leveler to make sure that the front wall is perfectly vertical. And we're also gonna check the square of the shed later on to confirm that we're perfectly square and that everything is plumb. After that, I grabbed my drill and some exterior rated screws and I put a few screws from the bottom plate into the shed base frame. And then I'm taking some screws here and I'm connecting the side wall to the front wall permanently with a handful of screws. With those connected, I grabbed my brother and then we grabbed the back wall and we moved it into place, which was obviously much easier with two people. We then lifted it up into place on the shed base frame and then we adjusted it as needed to get it perfectly flush with the back of the shed base frame. Once we were happy with how everything was looking and it was perfectly flush, we installed some screws from the bottom plate into the shed base frame to temporarily secure it in place. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a handful of screws and we're gonna attach the side wall to the back wall, kind of toenailing it in at an angle. A very important part of the shed build that I actually did not capture was you need to square your shed. And what this means is you're gonna run a tape measure from both corners at the top of your shed to make sure that the distance is the same from both sets of opposite corners. Here's what I mean. So when you see right here, you wanna make sure that your walls aren't skewed or slightly going to the left or right because that means that your siding won't line up right. You'll have little errors all over the place. So take a tape measure, measure from the inside corners or the outside corners of the two opposite sides and keep adjusting your shed walls until you get dimensions that are the exact same from this set of dimensions from opposite corners and this set of dimensions from opposite corners. So after squaring your shed and making sure that your walls are perfectly plumb and that nothing is skewed, I went back and then I took a bunch of additional screws and made sure that my connections between adjacent walls were very sturdy. I then went back and applied additional nails in the bottom plate and I did that all the way around the shed. Basically, install as many fasteners as you need to feel confident in your shed wall framing and that your walls are not gonna move around too much. As you can see, I'm also attaching the side wall to the front wall using a bunch of nails, and I obviously did this for both sides. After installing all of the additional fasteners, I went and removed the bar clamps to proceed to the next step. Okay, so that was definitely a little sketchy. Um, this was a lot bigger than I guess I realized on my model. And you know, this front wall here probably weighs a couple hundred pounds. It was difficult to lift, but we have it in place right now. It's, uh, it's big. It's, uh, it's something. After lifting all four of the shed walls into place and confirming that the walls are perfectly square, which is basically just indicating that you don't have it skewed either way and that each wall is perfectly plumb, 
what you're going to want to do is install the double top plate along the top of the walls and that's going to secure and tie all the walls together so for the double top plate, you're going to have two pieces of top plate that are nine foot, eight and a half inches. And this is going to be long enough to span the entire length of the side wall while also overlapping the entire length of the back wall, which is that additional three and a half inches. Cut your two pieces of nine foot, eight and a half inch top plate and then position it in place on top of the side wall. Make sure you get rid of any dirt or debris that might be on top of the side wall, just so you don't sandwich it in between. The cleaner your lumber is, the longer it'll last. So get it positioned, make sure that the double top plate is completely flush with the side wall. And once you're happy with how everything is looking, spend some time looking at the back end to make sure that it's perfectly flush with the back wall. Once the piece of double top plate is positioned where you need it, attach it to the side wall and back wall using a bunch of nails. After attaching the first piece of nine foot, eight and a half inch top plate on the other side of the shed, we moved on to the near side of the shed and attached it the exact same way. As you can see, we're using a bar clamp to make sure that the double top plate is perfectly flush with the side wall below. Use plenty of nails to fasten the double top plate to the wall below. Next up, Cut the back piece of double top plate to nine foot five inches and position it in place on top of the back wall. Then you'll simply attach it the same way you did for the other side pieces of double top plate. We're up here at the top, got our top cap. We're just gonna install this now. As shown, use a bar clamp to make sure that your double top plate is completely flush with the top of the wall below, and then use a bunch of framing nails to attach the double top plate to the back wall below. At this point, your shed wall framing is complete, and after you give it a quick strength test to make sure you're comfortable with how everything is secured, you can move on to the next lesson. So for this next step, we're gonna cut out the segment of bottom plate that's at the base of the door's rough opening. So as you can see here, there is a six foot segment of bottom plate that we're gonna to need to cut out at the base of the door's rough opening. To do this, I recommend that you take a reciprocating saw and simply hold it flush with the rough opening of the door against the wall stud, and then slide it down until you've cut all the way through that one side of two by four bottom plate. After you've cut one side free, you're gonna move on to the other side and you're gonna cut that other side of the bottom plate free. And again, use your reciprocating saw and cut straight down along that stud. Continue to use reciprocating saw until you cut all the way through the two by four. And once you get all the way through it, you'll be able just to use your hands to lift that bottom plate out of place. Here I am checking to make sure it's loose. And then I'm moving here to the other side to completely pull it out of the opening. Once you've completed that, you're pretty much done. What is going on guys? So in the last video, we built the shed walls and in this video, we're gonna frame the shed roof, put some plywood on and get ready to actually install some asphalt shingles in the next video. So without wasting time, let's get into it. So this video is all about the shed roof, but in the last two videos, we built a shed base frame and we framed the shed walls. So I'll leave links in the descriptions if you need to check out those videos. But to get this party started, we're gonna establish our rafter length, our rafter spacing, and then we're gonna talk about our bird's mouth cuts for the rafters. And for my roof rafters, I use two by six by 16 foot lumber. So the first step in framing your shed roof is to determine the overhang at the back and the desired overhang at the front. In my case, I wanted around three foot overhang at the front and one foot at the back, and then I needed 14 foot rafters to accomplish that. So I simply cut two foot off of the two by six by 16 foot lumber that I was gonna use for my roof rafters. The number of roof rafters you'll need will depend on your roof rafter spacing. I recommend between 12 and 16 inches. I was a little bit more conservative here with about 10 and a half inch spacing in between my rafters, but you want to space your rafters so that the plywood you install later will have edges that land directly in the center of a roof rafter. Now, I understand that planning out your roof rafter spacing can be a bit time consuming and a pain in the butt. So if you want access to the exact spacing I use for this 10 by 10 shed, you can check the link in the description. After cutting all of the rafters to length, I took one of the rafters and put it on top of the shed roof just to get an idea of how it would look. I made a few adjustments to get the overhang at the front and back. And as you can see here, it's not laying flat on the back wall or the front wall of the shed. This is where something called a bird's mouth cut comes into play. A bird's mouth cut is simply a cut you're going to make on your rafters to account for the angle of the roof or the pitch. And this is going to allow the roof rafter to sit flat on the top plate. So for this modern shed, we're going to need to cut a bird's mouth at the front where the rafter rests on the front wall and also at the back where the roof rafter rests on the back wall. 
To mark the locations for the bird's mouth cuts, I recommend that you go to the back of the rafter and you mark the overhang over the back. So as you can see here, I've marked my desired overhang at the back of the shed, which is around, you know, 14 and a half inches. You can see that pencil mark. And once we have it established on the back, when we move to the front of the rafter, we can see exactly where that lines up and we can mark that bird's mouth as well. After marking the front and the back locations for the bird's mouth cuts, the next thing we need to do is calculate the roof pitch. So in order to actually cut our bird's mouth for the shed rafters, we really need to establish the pitch of the roof. So the pitch of a shed roof is determined based on the number of inches the shed roof rises vertically. For every 12 inches, the roof extends horizontally. For example purposes only, let's take a look at a shed that extends 12 feet horizontally and two feet vertically. In this example, when you convert that to inches, the shed roof rises 24 inches over a 144 inch length. In other words, this shed roof will rise two inches for every 12 inches that it extends horizontally. This equates to a 212 roof pitch, which is the same roof pitch we're gonna use for this shed. So starting at the back of the rafter, we positioned our carpenter square at the 14 and 5 eighths inch mark, and we just marked all the way across the rafter so we have that reference line. So after marking the back of the bird's mouth cut at 14 and 5 eighths inches across the entire length of the rafter, you're gonna measure three and a half inches over from that line towards the front of the shed. Again, we're at the back right here. Then make another mark using the carpenter square all the way across for reference. By marking three and a half inches from the initial line, we've essentially established where the rafter is gonna rest on the two by four top plate of the back wall. As you can see right here, I'm showing how the rafter will be positioned on the top plate. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna cut out the bird's mouth so that it's gonna sit flat upon that two by four. Again, a two by four standard width is three and a half inches. Next, take the carpenter square and place it so that it's perfectly vertical with the original line that is 14 and 5 eighths inches from the back of the rafter. Using the pivot point, which is at the bottom right corner of the square, we're gonna rotate the square in the direction of where it's going to sit on the top plate. In this instance, we're rotating it towards the front of the shed. We're gonna rotate it until we get to the two marking on the common rafter scale, as I'll show when I zoom in right here. You see, it says pivot right there on that pivot point. And then we're gonna go until you see the two, which is right there. And that's where it says common. So as you can see, that's our common rafter right there. We have that on the two. And now we're gonna go ahead and make that mark. So get everything lined up. And we're gonna go ahead and make a mark just like that. What we're gonna do now is take a framing square as you see like this. And there's our mark. And we're gonna take this here and we're gonna move it down parallel until it just intersects with that line there. And then we'll mark it. Okay. This part right here is called the heel. And this part right here is called the seat. At this point, we have our marks. It's time to cut out this shaded segment right here. And here's a quick reminder of what that seat cut and heel cut looks like on the model, and here's what it looks like in real life. Now, before we actually cut these out, let's move to the front of the roof rafter, and let's make the bird's mouth markings for the front as well. So as you can see there at that line, we're gonna go ahead and establish the line all the way across with the carpenter square. We're then gonna mark three and a half inches across, which is where it's gonna land on the top plate of the front wall. We're gonna make that line mark all the way across. Then we're gonna take our carpenter square, we're gonna position it so the pivot point is at the bottom right there, and then we're gonna rotate it until it hits the two on the common rafter scale. Two represents a 212 roof pitch, and then we're gonna make that mark. Now we're gonna take our framing square, position it in place, slide it down along the angled marking until it intersects with our second line. And then we're gonna mark it with a pencil, just like before. Once we have the bird's mouth cuts established on the front and back of the rafter, we can finally cut them out. Now there are a lot of different ways you can actually make these cuts. You can use a circular saw like I'm doing right now to cut out the heel cut, but you can also use you know, a Japanese pull saw, you can use a hacksaw, you can use a jigsaw. I started with a circular saw and it was a little bit tricky because these bird's mouth cuts are so small and precise. As you can see here, I had to pull the guard out of the way to actually be able to make that cut. So use your imagination and use whatever tool you're most comfortable with. I started with a circular saw and I wasn't able to get all the way across, so I had to go back and clean that up later. To finish up this bird's mouth cut, I used a hacksaw, but I'm gonna use a jigsaw in a later example. 
After flipping it over, you can see how the bird's mouth cut on the back of the rafter will look. Now that we've completed that one, let's move on to the front and complete the bird's mouth cut on the front rafter the exact same way. As you can see, taking the circular saw and I'm making the heel cut, and then I'm doing the cleanup work with a jigsaw this time instead of a handsaw. So once we have the bird's mouth cuts on the back of the rafter and the front of the rafter made for the first roof rafter, let's go put it in place. So after cutting the first bird's mouth on the first rafter, position it in place on top of the shed and take a look. So taking a look at the bird's mouth cut on the back of the rafter, it sits okay. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. You can see that the heel cut is lined up exactly where it needs to be. Moving on to the front of the shed, we can see that the bird's mouth cut looks pretty good here as well. There's a little bit of cleanup work that could be done. So if you're not happy with how the bird's mouth cut is lining up on either the front or the back wall, you can always cut another rafter and test it in place until you get a fit that you're happy with. The idea is you want to get one rafter that's going to be perfect that you can use as a template to mark all the rest of your rafters. Okay, so at this point, I cut another one that I'm a little more happy with. So there's that. Here's the one on the other end. So it looks pretty good. Now I'm going to use this one. I'm going to put it on top of the next one and use it as a template to cut out all the rest. So as I just mentioned, you're gonna take your template rafter and you're gonna put it in place on top of the next rafter. I use clamps to make sure that everything was perfectly in line and I did that on both sides. One there to secure it, make sure it was perfectly even and then I confirmed that on the back as you're seeing now. Once getting the template on top of the next rafter, I marked it with a pen there, a pencil would also work. There I am marking the back and now I'm gonna move on and mark the front. Then once you've made your marks, you're gonna release the clamps and you'll have the marking that you can then go back and clean up if you need to before cutting it out. Here's a look of the bird's mouth cut that we just traced and now we'll actually cut them out. Now you want to mark the very first template board and you want to use the same rafter template to mark all the rest of the rafters. You don't want to keep marking one and switching over because the error will compound and you might run into a problem. So pick the best rafter first, use it as a template and use that same one when marking all the rest of the rafters. So repeat this process of marking the bird's mouth cuts using the template board for all the rest of the rafters and cut them out. I recommend that every few rafters you place it up on top of the shed and make sure that everything is still looking right. You want to be able to make any corrections or tweaks as you need. Now, once you've cut all the bird's mouths for all of your rafters, you want to mark the rafter spacing on the front wall top plate and the back wall top plate. So as you can see here, we're on the back wall of the shed and we're running a tape measure along the top plate of the back wall. Then we're going to go back and we're going to mark each roof rafter location based on the spacing that we mapped out. Again, you want to space your roof rafters around 12 to 16 inches on center and you want to position the rafter so that the edges of the plywood decking that we'll install later is going to land directly in the center of a roof rafter. We're repeating the same process for the front wall. Obviously, the spacing on the front wall and the back wall needs to be the same. So after marking the roof rafter spacing on the front wall and the back wall, it's time to position all 11 of the rafters in place. Using some ladders and getting the help of my brother, we put all 11 of the roof rafters on top of the shed just to get them up there, and then we'll go back and space them out appropriately. So at this point, we're taking the 11 rafters and we're spacing them so that they line up on the marks we made on the front wall top plate as well as the back wall top plate. And here's a real quick look at the rafters spaced out on top of the shed. So after getting the rafter space according to the plan, I tacked them in with a framing nailer just to hold them in place temporarily. What we're doing is we're just gonna tack in the first couple with a nail gun. And before we nail it, you can see that the rafter is positioned right on that line that we marked, just to hold them in place. So we'll do that for this one, and then we're gonna do that all the way across. So we got it lined up. And now we'll do this all the way across. Okay, so we got everything tacked initially and then we went back through with our hurricane ties. And you can see for the end, we had to use this type to get it flush. And then we're using hurricane ties, which we'll do for all of the rest of the rafters. We'll also do it in the back here. So as I just explained in the field, you're gonna to need to use rafter ties for the outermost rafters. And then we went back in and we used the more sturdy, at least in my opinion, hurricane ties for all the rest of the rafters. Right, so at this point, we have all of our hurricane ties in at the top and we're plugging away at the bottom here. We got a couple more to do and then we'll be rocking and rolling. Once we have all of our rafters in place, it's time to actually install the fascia boards on the front and back of the shed. 
So just like you wanted an overhang for the front and back of the shed, you likely want an overhang on the sides of the shed as well. As you can see here, we have a one foot overhang on both sides. So we're gonna need a 12 foot two by six for both the front and back fascia board. But before we install the fascia boards, let's work smarter and not harder. So let's install the blocking in between each of the roof rafters. But because we cut the bird's mouse, we can't use a standard two by six piece of lumber because when you put it in between the rafters, you can see that it will stick out just a little bit. Again, because we cut a little bit of the width off with that bird's mouth. As a result, what you're gonna do is take a circular saw and you're gonna rip off around an eighth of an inch. So the piece of blocking you install between each rafter is not gonna protrude up further than the actual rafters introducing a complication when we go to install the plywood. So after ripping around an eighth of an inch off each piece of blocking, we're gonna go ahead and cut them to size so they fit in between each rafter. Again, we spaced our rafters so that we had 10 and a half inch pieces of blocking in between each, but if you want access to all the plans, check the link in the description. There's always a possibility for a little bit of compounding human error when making measurements, so definitely field verify the distance to make sure that you're not cutting all your blocking to a dimension that's marginally off. Continue to cut all of your blocking, and now we can go ahead and install it. As you can see here, we're taking the piece of blocking and we're inserting it in. You can see because we ripped it down, it's sitting beneath the rafters, which is exactly what you want. And you wanna make sure that the piece of blocking is flush with the outermost edge of the top plate of the back wall, which we're doing first. Then you're gonna take your framing nailer, and you can see I'm trying to toenail in. The first one I did was not good, but you can see that we're getting better as we go. So make sure that the pieces of blocking are flush with the outermost edge of the top plate, and you're gonna go ahead and toenail it in as needed. Continue to install all of the 10 and a half inch pieces of blocking, and the purpose of this blocking is just to prevent birds from going on the inside and making nests, and also it looks better from the inside. So here I am doing the last 10 and a half inch piece between those two rafters, and then installing the nine and three quarter inch piece on the very edge. Now that we've installed all the blocking, let's go install the 12 foot pieces of fascia board on the front and back of the shed. So first things first, we're gonna mark 12 foot on our two by six lumber, and we're gonna cut that for both the front fascia board and the back fascia board. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take both of our fascia boards and we're gonna mark one foot from the edge. This is gonna indicate exactly where that line needs to fall on the outermost roof rafter. Make this mark on the fascia board on both sides. So here's a little trick of the trade. I put this together, I just put a screw through and I put it on this scrap piece from one of the bird's mouths. And then what I'm gonna do is go ahead and mount it there. So although having a helper is best, here's a trick if you need to install these fascia boards on your own. You can create some kind of apparatus like you're seeing there, and you're gonna temporarily screw it to the bottom of your outermost roof rafter. Then it can basically support the fascia board as you install it. Here's what I mean by that. So even though I have the luxury of a helper, installing that temporary support bracket on the outermost roof rafter is still helpful when you're doing the installation of the fascia board. So as you can see, we're checking right there to make sure that we have the one foot mark positioned on the outermost edge of that fascia board. And then I'm taking a drill with some three inch screws and securing the fascia board, making sure it's crown up into the outside of the roof rafters. As you can see, I'm making sure it's flush there and I'm gonna go ahead and install. It's a little bit tricky to do this. I should have moved the ladder so that I was actually on the fascia board but basically do what you can to install the fascia board to the roof rafters. Okay, so we got the front plate on there. As you can see, as I scale this sketchy ladder, we have this piece holding it in place. So that's not going anyway. So that's a nice little tip if you're doing this on your own, you can fasten it and let it rest. And then we have our line right there, and we're just gonna line that up so it's flush with this rafter. So like that and then we'll go ahead and screw it in place. Once you have your fascia board positioned correctly, you can screw it through the fascia board and into the rafter behind it. I use two screws to go into the fascia board and into each roof rafter. Then I just remove the temporary brace once I secure the fascia board to the outermost roof rafter. Next, it's simply a matter of attaching the fascia board to each roof rafter and I use three inch screws and I use two screws per connection. I also used a bar clamp to make sure that the fascia board was perfectly flush with the tops of the roof rafters. Then you're simply gonna screw this in for all of them. Although you could use a framing nailer here, I chose to use screws since I think it's a slightly more secure connection. 
Now, after doing the front fascia board, let's move on and install the 12 foot fascia board on the back of the shed. Just like the front of the shed, we're gonna install that temporary support brace on the outermost roof rafter, and then we're gonna lift the 12 foot fascia board into place. We're crowning the board right there to make sure that it's crown up. And again, pay attention to crown for all of the shed installation. You wanna make sure that everything is crown up on the roof. That goes for all the roof rafters. So at this point, you're gonna to wanna to make sure your one foot offset is positioned on each of the outermost rafters. And then we're gonna secure the fascia board to each rafter with two three inch screws per connection. The exact same way we did for the front fascia board. After installing the fascia boards, we're gonna install the outermost roof rafters that are gonna overhang the sides of the shed. These are gonna be cut to 14 foot length and you should have done that when you were cutting the initial roof rafters. If you jacked up any of your bird's mouth cuts, this is where you will install those messed up 14 foot roof rafters. So after establishing the crown, we're gonna go ahead and move it into place and we're gonna get it flush with the outside of the fascia board. We're using bar clamps to hold it in place and then we're simply gonna do two screws through the fascia board into the overhanging roof rafter the exact same way we did for all of the other roof rafters that we uh, we did previously so again that's two three inch screws going through the fascia board and into the overhanging roof joist and then we're going to go ahead to the other side and put two screws in once we had it exactly flush with the outermost fascia board after installing the roof rafter overhang on that side of the shed we moved on to the other side of the shed and repeated the exact same process again that's taking the 14 foot roof rafter putting it in place in between the fascia boards, holding it in place temporarily with the bar clamps, and then putting two screws through the fascia board into each roof rafter connection. So as you can see, we use the clamp there to make sure that we have it flush on the side. And then he's just gonna screw that in right there. Now the last thing we need to do is install the six pieces of blocking that attach the overhanging roof rafter to the adjacent roof rafter. Now, these pieces of blocking are gonna be 10 and a half inches, but you wanna field verify that distance between those two rafters just to account for any possibility of human error. Cut all 12 pieces of blocking, six per side, to size based on the rafter overhang you established. Now, unfortunately, I did not capture footage of installing this blocking, but it's very similar to how we did the other blocking between the rafters. Position them in place and use bar clamps to temporarily hold them, and use your framing nailer to nail two nails at each connection location. So now that we've framed the entire shed roof, let's install the plywood roof sheathing, which is gonna be the decking that we install the asphalt shingles on in the next video. To actually install the plywood roof sheathing, I put two or three sheets on top of the roof just so I had a surface to walk on. And after putting a couple sheets up, by kind of just shoving the plywood in over my head, I climbed up on top of the roof and I got the sheets of plywood positioned as shown here. This spacing is based on my course guide, so check the link in the description if you want access to the spacing and the plywood Wood segments I use to create my plywood roof deck. So after getting a few sheets of plywood sheathing on top of the roof so I had a stable walking surface, I climbed up on top of the shed. But be careful, you're up on an elevated surface, which if you're not careful, could be dangerous. So it was very hard to film here, but what we're doing is we're arranging the plywood similar to what you're seeing here. And based on our roof rafter spacing, what that's gonna mean is that the edges of the plywood are gonna land directly in the center of a roof rafter. That way it'll be fully supported. Once you get the plywood pieces preliminarily in place, you're going to use your framing nailer to tack the plywood into place into a few of the roof rafters. We're gonna go back and install a bunch of nails later on. After installing the first three horizontal full sheets, we're gonna cut that final sheet at the bottom. And in theory, we should cut that to eight foot long by two foot three inch wide, but I always like to field verify. So what I'm showing here is I have the first three full sheets in place and here is the fourth sheet of plywood that obviously overhangs the back of the shed. So after positioning it where it needs to be, I went on the underside and I marked the cut line. Again, this should be eight foot long by two foot three inches wide, but I always like to field verify. So my brother's up there removing the temporary fastener that we used to hold it in place. And now I'm pulling it off the shed so I can make the cut along the line with my circular saw. As always, I'm propping up the piece of plywood using some blocking underneath so I'm not contacting the ground or anything with the saw as I make the cut. After cutting the bottom piece to size, we lifted the piece of plywood sheathing back on top, got it positioned in place at the bottom of the shed there, and once we had it exactly where it needed to be, we tacked it in place with a couple temporary screws, but you could also use nails in your framing nailer. 
After installing all four of the horizontal pieces of plywood, if you will, we moved on to the vertical pieces. So we're lifting the second vertical piece up into place. We already installed the first vertical piece in the upper right hand corner of the shed. And it's a little bit tricky as always, but it's very doable. So we're getting it preliminarily positioned right now. And we're gonna put a temporary screw in to hold the piece of plywood in place while we field measure at the bottom. Again, in theory, this should be a six foot three inch long by four foot wide piece of plywood. But you know me, I always like to field measure. And there I'm using a chalk line to establish the cut line. And for this piece of plywood sheathing, we got aggressive and we simply adjusted the blade height so that it was the exact same depth as the piece of plywood and we cut it in place on top of the shed. At this point, we preliminarily installed all of our plywood roof sheathing. We just didn't install all the nails. So we're gonna go back and install nails every 12 inches on center. Okay, so at this point, I put nails into the board to indicate where the rafters are. And then I'm gonna go down to the other side and mark a chalk line so that I can nail the wood down. So as you just heard in the field, I put a temporary nail at the top of the shed that indicates where the roof rafter is. And then I took a chalk line to the other end of the shed and where the roof rafter was positioned at the back, I snapped the chalk line to hopefully indicate the location of the roof rafter along the entire length of the shed. After doing the first one, I simply moved the chalk line to the next roof rafter, snapped the chalk line, and you get the picture. I repeated this snap line process for every roof rafter along the entire length of the shed. And this is an important step to make sure that all your framing nails that go through the plywood roof sheathing hit a roof rafter. All right, so at this point you can see I have all the lines. Now it's time to nail them all in. I simply took my framing nailer and every 12 inches on center, I attached the plywood roof sheathing to the roof rafters below. And this was easy to do since I had the chalk lines that showed exactly where the roof rafters were. Repeat this process across the entire roof, making sure that you secure all the sheets of plywood to the roof rafters every 12 inches on center. You may need to angle some of your nails to make sure that it contacts a roof rafter appropriately. And at this point, we've successfully completed our lean-to shed roof framing and the decking installation. What's going on, everybody? So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to install T111 or LP smart siding on your shed or outdoor structure. This is gonna show you how to position the sheets in place, how to fasten them, how to make sure the overlap and underlap edges are meeting up properly, and finally, just some tips and tricks on how to get a good installation. With that said, let's get into the video. What's going on guys? So this video is all about how to install shed siding, but if you still need to learn how to frame your shed, you can check out my previous videos in the description. So T111 and LP Smart Siding are very similar and they're the most common shed siding options in my opinion. They're basically a four by eight sheet of pressure treated engineered plywood paneling. I personally think LP Smart Siding is a little bit better, but I have a blog article comparing the two that you can check out in the description. So a successful LP Smart Siding installation starts with planning. In this case, we framed our wall so that the total height once the bottom was positioned on our ledger board would land directly in the center of the double top plate at the top. That way we could use a full eight foot sheet. So for my shed, I used a piece of trim board at the bottom, which will serve as a ledger that we can rest our siding on as we install it. So for my ledger board, I used three and a half inch PVC trim that I pre-painted black, but if you're not planning on installing trim, you can just put a few temporary nails in at the bottom and you can rest the siding on that. But in my case, I'm using this trim and I attached it to the shed frame base with screws. But in hindsight, I should have just used some brad nails because covering those up later with caulk was a pain in the butt. So I'm using eight foot long segments. So I'm filling in the partial sheets there. And then I repeated this process around the entire perimeter of the shed. Now, if you plan on installing a shed ramp at the front, you don't want a piece of trim going the entire length. Instead, you wanna plan out how wide your shed ramp is gonna be, and you wanna cut your trim so that it goes on either side. So after installing the PVC ledger trim at the bottom of the shed base, we can now use that as a ledger to install our panels of LP smart siding. Now I recommend that you pre-paint your panels. I just find it's easier, but you could obviously install the panels and paint them later. I'm just using my Graco paint sprayer and I highly recommend this for big paint jobs. So at this point, it's time to install the first panel and the first panel on each wall is the most critical because it's gonna set up the success of the remaining panels that you install. So these panels have an overlap edge and an underlap edge and you wanna have the underlap edge positioned in the center of a stud as shown. This means that when starting, you're always gonna have your overlap edge in the corner. So in this case, the corner is towards the front of the shed. 
So I have my overlap edge there and I'm making sure that it's perfectly in line with the front of the shed and I wanna make sure that it's perfectly plumb and square all the way across. You wanna make sure that you have the same distance at the top plate, which is gonna indicate that your shed is square. If you're skewed now, it's gonna throw you off for the rest of your panel installations. So definitely take care when installing this first sheet. As you can see, I'm using a bar clamp to hold it in place. And if you planned out your wall framing appropriately, the underlap edge should land directly in the middle of a stud. Now I'm using screws here just to temporarily hold it in place. I don't know why I did this. I have a framing nailer and I used it later on, but a framing nailer is definitely gonna be a lot easier to fasten this with than screws. With the first piece of siding tacked in place with a few screws, I grabbed a second sheet and I positioned it in place. So as you can see in the figure, the second sheet of smart side panel is gonna be installed so that the overlap edge rests on top of the first panel's underlap so that it touches the alignment bead as shown in the figure. You're then gonna fasten through the second panel and through the first panel through the overlap using a fastener that embeds a minimum of one and a half inches into the stud. But because we have a window here, what I did is I just got it in place and I used a bar clamp to temporarily hold it where it needs to be. Then I went on the inside, I marked the window cutout with a Sharpie, and then I just pulled that panel off and made the cut. For me, this is easier, but you could obviously measure this instead of putting it on and taking it off. So to cut out the window penetration, I used a circular saw and I just made four plunge cuts. You're gonna need to hold the guard out of the way to make these, and these are a little bit tricky, so definitely be careful and keep safety in mind. Now with the circular saw, you're not able to go all the way in the corners without overcutting. So I use a jigsaw to cut out the corners and get everything cleaned up. So once we cut out the window, we can actually position the panel in place for real this time and permanently fasten it to the shed. I used a few screws again, just to hold it in place. And I'm gonna go back later with a nail gun and hit all the intermediate studs. So at this point, we have our first two panels installed. One panel has the window cut out and now we need to install the partial panel towards the back. As you can see, this is gonna be a two foot wide segment. And because these are four foot by eight foot panels, that means we're gonna to need to cut one of these panels in half lengthwise. So to cut these LP smart siding panels, I just used a tape measure to mark the two feet, use a chalk line to establish the cut line. And then I used some four by fours underneath the piece of siding to get it above the ground and ran a circular saw across. Nothing groundbreaking there, but after making the cut, we're gonna position the overlap edge so that it's on top of the underlap edge that we installed on the second sheet by the window. And now I'm finally using the correct piece of equipment, which is a framing nailer. And I'm using two inch exterior rated galvanized nails and I'm using nails every eight inches on center or so. On the back wall there, you wanna ensure that the piece of siding is completely flush with the back wall and that it's not poking out. And then go back and hit all the intermediate studs with nails. Sometimes it's tough to identify where those studs are located behind the siding. So you can either measure from the edge based on your stud spacing or there I'm showing that I marked where the stud is at the top and the bottom so that I have a reference line to make sure that I go through the siding and into a stud every eight inches on center. Here I am going back and installing nails every eight inches on center for the piece of panels that I installed with screws. Again, don't know why I did that. I should have used nails from the start. Now at this point, we've installed the LP Smart Siding on the sidewall. Now we can move on to the back wall. Again, we're gonna have our overlap edge positioned so that it is flush with the outside of the wall there. Then I'm using the temporary screws again, stupidly. You can see we're gonna have a butt edge there. Don't worry about that because we're gonna cover it with trim in a later video. So here you can see that that first panel is lining up directly in the center of a stud so that we install the overlap edge of the next sheet. It's gonna be directly in the center of a stud. So here I am taking the second sheet, positioning the overlap edge of the sheet in my hands on top of the underlap edge from the sheet we installed in the corner, making sure that everything is lining up. I wanna make sure that my spacing at the top plate is the same all the way across, and also that the underlap edge is lining up in the direct center of a stud, which it is. Then I'm gonna go back and install nails every eight inches on center. Now we're gonna install that partial sheet Again, we're gonna cut that piece of panel to size using a circular saw. Keep track of the underlap and overlap edges when you're cutting so you don't make a mistake. Now we're moving over to the final sidewall. As you can see, we marked the window penetration again and we're doing the plunge cuts just like we did on the first sidewall. And then we're gonna use the jigsaw to clean everything up and then we're putting it in place so that the overlap edge goes on top of the sheet we installed previously and that cut section is towards the back corner. Now, this LP smart siding installation is gonna go so much smoother if you planned out your stud spacing so that every underlap and overlap edge is gonna land exactly where it needs to in the center of a stud. So if you want the plans and the exact stud spacing I use for my 10x10 shed, you can check the link in the description. 
Okay, so the last part of the LP smart side installation is to cut the panels for the front wall of the shed. So to get the look I wanted on the front of the shed, I went a little bit rogue and I installed the LP smart siding horizontally instead of vertically on the front. This involved a four x two panel and a two x two panel. So just like before, I used a chalk line to cut my panels to size. There's a smaller two x two panel and I'm getting the underlap edge so it's positioned towards the top and then I'm installing nails every eight inches on center and then I'm positioning the overlap edge of the four x two panel on top of the underlap edge of the panel we installed below and then I'm making sure that it's flush on the outside corner as well. Here I am doing the same thing for the other side. I'm marking the cut line with the chalk line. I'm gonna cut it to size with a circular saw. I'm gonna install the two by two panel, make sure that it's perfectly level, install nails every eight inches on center, making sure that the panel is flush with the outside corner and also the inside there where the door's rough opening is, and then more nails every eight inches on center. And I forgot to paint this panel, so I'm doing that now. So at this point, we've successfully installed LP Smart Siding on the shed. What's going on everybody? So in the last few videos in this modern shed build series, we framed the shed walls and then we installed the T111 siding around the perimeter. And now in this video, I'm gonna show you how I attach the sheathing, which is just half inch plywood to the front of the shed and the sides. We're also gonna install soffit sheathing, which is kind of a pain. After we get that sheathing in place, we can install the veneer, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start with the sheathing. So if you still need to frame your shed walls or install T111 siding, check the videos in the description. But now we're gonna install the sheathing. Let's start by installing the plywood sheathing on the front wall of the shed. So because I'm kind of lazy when it comes to pre-measuring, I would rather just hang a full sheet of plywood where it's gonna actually be installed with bar clamps so I can temporarily hold it in place while I mark the cutouts for the windows, all three right there, and then the door's rough opening. Then we just went on the outside, we removed the temporary bar clamps, pulled that sheet down, and now we're just gonna cut out all of the window and door penetrations. So to cut everything out, I just propped a sheet of plywood up on some 4x4s to get it up off the ground, and then I used a circular saw to cut out the edges of the window, and I just made a punch cut there. I cleaned up the inside corners with a jigsaw just to prevent any kind of overcutting with the circular saw. Here I am cutting out the door's rough opening, running that along the cut line, and then I'm gonna pull that sheet of plywood out of place, and then we're just gonna go back and we're gonna make plunge cuts for all of these interior windows. This is a little bit tricky to make these plunge cuts. You're gonna have to lift the guard out of the way and always keep safety in mind when using a saw or any equipment. I recommend some safety glasses. Ultimately, safety is your responsibility, but I went back here and I cut up the inside corners to avoid the overcut again with a circular saw. After cutting the window penetrations and the door's rough opening, we lifted the sheet of plywood back into place and we permanently fastened it with a few screws. The screws are just to hold it in place. I'm gonna go back later with a framing nailer and fully secure it to the framing behind. After getting the first sheet in place, we grabbed a second sheet and again, we used bar clamps to temporarily hold it in place. We then went on the inside and we marked the window cut opening. And then you're also gonna have to mark where it overhangs on the outside of the shed so we can cut that flush. I didn't show marking that, but you're gonna need to do that. So after marking everything, we went on the outside. I used a chalk line to establish my cut line, cut that with a circular saw, and then we're just gonna go back and cut out the window penetration, just like we did for the other sheet. And just like before, we're gonna lift this sheet of plywood back into place, make sure that everything looks good on the window, and then I secured it there with screws. We're gonna go back later and hit that with nails. So now we have the sheathing installed on the front of the shed, and now we're gonna move on to the sides. Now again, I like to field measure my stuff, so I installed the first few rafters, and I didn't install the overhanging rafter so that I could take the piece of sheathing, clamp it in place temporarily with bar clamps, and then I could go on the inside of the shed and I could scribe the line that I was actually gonna need to cut. So here I am scribing the cut line along the bottom of that rafter. We're pulling off that temporarily fastened piece of plywood and cutting it along the marked line with a circular saw. And then it's as simple as actually putting it back in place and it should fit perfectly. But we're gonna need a few pieces of blocking installed so we can actually fasten that piece of sheathing in place. So to do this, I clamped a two by four to the rafter right there just with some bar clamps. And then I went in with a framing nailer and fastened it to the roof rafter. Then I went underneath with another two by four and placed it on the bottom. And this is just one way to do it. I found that this would work for me. You can do this a bunch of different ways, but I found that this was gonna make it easy to install the little cripple studs in between. So I fastened that second two by four there. And again, I used a framing nailer to attach it to the rafter and that piece of two by four blocking that we sistered to the roof rafter. And then I'm gonna go back and install these kind of cripple studs in between. 
So the way we found the angle is we just put it up so it was flush with the top plate there, and then we marked the line, and then we're gonna go back. We found that the angle was around 12 degrees, cut that on our miter saw, and then we just put a few of those in so that we're gonna have a nice secure stud behind the sheathing that we can fasten it to. And what I'm doing here is I'm marking the location of those cripple studs so that I know exactly where to nail so I hit a stud. And then we simply repeated this process for the other side of the shed. Now there's gonna be a few little partial pieces you may need to install, so I just kind of measured those, cut them to size, and then installed them with a few nails and screws. Now something to keep in mind is you typically want to install some flashing where the two segments of sheathing intersect. So basically where we have the plywood sheathing resting on top of the T111, you typically would install a piece of flashing right there. And it's called Z flashing and the idea is it keeps any water that drips down the sheathing from getting in between the sheathing and the T111. It's called Z flashing, you can look it up and you can install it for your shed if you'd like. But the way that I'm trimming the shed out, I'm just gonna take a piece of PVC trim and I'm gonna cover up the joint between the two and then I'm gonna go ahead and caulk the top and the bottom to keep any water from ever getting behind. So you can use flashing or you can use my method. The choice is yours. And I understand that I sound a bit like a broken record, but I do have a shed building course in the description which will show you how to complete every single step of this shed build from start to finish. So check that out if you are interested. So now that we have the sheathing installed on the front and sides of the shed, it's time to install the sheathing for the soffit. And this is kind of a pain. What you'll wanna do is take an inventory of all the leftover plywood you have, and then do some measurements on the bottom side of your shed roof. If you're working by yourself, you're probably gonna to wanna to cut this plywood soffit sheathing in smaller, more manageable sections. But the important thing here is that you line up the soffit sheathing with the edge of your roof rafters, and so it's flush with the fascia board on the front, and you wanna ensure that the edge of the soffit sheathing lands in the center of the roof rafters. So what I'm showing you here is how we're basically mimicking the plywood arrangement on the roof, and we're doing the same thing underneath. So we have the eight foot horizontal segment, and we cut it to length, and then we're gonna cut smaller segments and fill in the gaps as needed. So here we are doing the second piece on the front there. As you can see, I'm using bar clamps to temporarily hold it in place. And this is not easy. You know, you're working upside down on a ladder. This is why a lot of people leave the soffit off. But because we're going for a more professional look, it's worth the extra effort to install the soffit sheathing. So continue to field verify, install the soffit sheathing as you need. I used one and a half inch exterior rated screws to secure this instead of nails. Since we're working against gravity, I figured the extra additional security of screws was worth it. And here I am cutting the smaller soffit strips for the side of the shed. And then we're gonna go ahead to the side of the shed and install that piece of soffit. Again, using bar clamps to temporarily hold everything in place while we screw it to the blocking beneath with one and a half inch exterior rated screws. One important thing to note is you don't wanna have your soffit sheathing sticking out any further than the fascia board or the overhanging roof rafter. Here I am putting in the last piece, using a bar clamp to hold it in place, and then using one and a half inch exterior rated screws to secure it to the blocking below. And after completing the soffit installation on one side of the shed, we repeated the process for the other side. And although this is a pain in the butt to install the soffit sheathing, I really do think it gives the shed a more professional and better looking result. And after putting in these final screws, we've successfully installed the sheathing on our modern shed. What is going on guys? So in the last few videos in this modern shed build series, we framed the shed walls, we installed the LP smart siding, we installed the sheathing, and then in this video, we're gonna be installing the trim along the outside corners, around the windows, around the doors rough opening, basically all the trim. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. So as a reminder, I have videos in the description that go over every step that we've completed so far with the modern shed, but this video is all about trim. To start, we're gonna install the side trim on the outside corners of the shed. This corner trim is gonna cover up the butt edges from our siding installation that we did in a previous video. So I highly recommend that you pre-paint your PVC trim boards. I'll leave a link in the description for the materials I used, but you're gonna cut your piece of trim so that it covers the entire butt edge of that outside corner, and then you're gonna start by installing it on the less visible side. In our case, this is the side of the shed. As you can see, I'm resting that piece of trim on the bottom ledger board that we installed in a previous video, and you're gonna make sure that it's perfectly in line with the front of the shed, as I'm showing right here. Once you have a position where it needs to be, you're gonna go ahead and actually fasten that piece of trim to the shed, making sure that it remains flush with the front. I'm using screws here, but I should have used either brad nails 
or framing nails since the screws were a bit harder to cover up. Now we're gonna move on to the front of the shed and for this piece, what you're gonna do is position it so that the second piece overlaps the first piece of trim. So as you can see, I'm showing right now how we get it perfectly flush so that it looks like one continuous piece of trim. Once you have it positioned correctly for the entire length of the shed, go ahead and fasten it with either screws, brad nails, or framing nails. Now I'm moving on to the other side, and as you can see, I did the side piece of trim first and then fastened the front piece of trim, just like we did on the other side. After installing the trim boards on the front outside corners, you're gonna do the exact same thing on the back outside corners. And again, that's just cutting the piece of trim to length, installing it on the side first, and you may need to cut that piece of trim at a slight angle, in our case 12 degrees, to get it to match the roof pitch. Then I'm taking my other piece of trim and I'm installing it just like we did on the front of the shed, giving us a nice finished trim look. After trimming out the outside corners, we're going to move on and install trim around the door's rough opening. And just like the outside corners, we're using three and a half inch pieces of trim that we pre-painted. And we're going to install it so that the top of the piece of trim is completely flush with the top of the door's rough opening, as you can see here. After we get that one installed, we're going to go ahead and move over and install the one on the other side the exact same way. After getting both of the vertical pieces installed, we're going to install the horizontal piece of trim. And this is just going to be measured the distance all the way across, make sure it's perfectly flush, make some checks, confirm that it's level, and then attach it with either screws, brad nails, or framing nails. Next up, we're going to install one and a half inch pieces of trim to bridge the gap between the sheathing and the LP smart siding below. So to do this, we measured the distance, cut the one and a half inch piece of trim to size, and then we installed it so that it's centered between the gap. Again, I use screws here, but brad nails or framing nails would have been a bit more appropriate. Use a level as needed to make sure you're level all the way across. After installing the one and a half piece of trim on one side of the shed, do the exact same thing on the other. That is, making sure it's level and bridging the gap between the sheathing and the LP smart siding. Here's how we look so far. Next up, we're going to install trim around the front windows. Now, I'm going to have a dedicated video showing how I install these windows, but for now, I'm going to show you how I trim them out. So the idea here is that I'll install trim around the entire window perimeter, but I'll leave a half an inch overlap so that when I go on the inside, I'll be able to push a piece of acrylic panel so that it actually contacts that half inch overlap. So here I am attaching the 1.5 inch piece of trim around the entire perimeter. So if we take a look from the inside of the model, you can see that we have a half inch overhang around the entire edge of the window. This half inch overhang is gonna provide a surface that we can push our window panels into and that it can mount against. And here's a look at the window trim installed from the inside. And as a reminder, if you wanna learn exactly how to build a 10 by 10 shed you saw in this video, you can check out my shed building course in the description. So once we had our trim installed so that we have a half inch overlap around the entire perimeter, I'm gonna install some construction adhesive and then we're gonna take our acrylic window panels and we're gonna push them into place so that the panels contact the half inch overlap around the entire perimeter. Again, I'm gonna have a dedicated video for this a little bit later, but just wanted to show you how it looked preliminarily. Next up, we're gonna install the 1.5 inch side trim along the side of the shed. Now again, this side trim is just to bridge the gap between the LP smart siding we installed below and the sheathing we installed above. But as you can see, I'm fastening the piece of trim so that it's centered between the two and I'm confirming level all the way across. There's also a partial piece at the back you'll need to install. Here I am repeating that exact same 1.5 inch PVC trim installation process on the other side of the shed. And after completing the side trim, it's time to install the PVC fascia trim boards. The fascia trim boards are seven and a quarter inches wide in order to cover up the actual two by six lumber that we frame behind it. So as you can see here, we lifted the piece of trim and got it flush with the front of the shed and then we tacked it in place with framing nails. Now we're gonna install the partial piece at the back. As you can see, we're marking the overhang right there and cutting it to size. And the idea is you want that piece of trim to be flush with the back of the shed. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Here we are showing how it's flush with the front and here we are marking the back, cutting it flush, and here's a look at how it's flush with the back. Now we're gonna move on and install the fascia trim at the front. This is gonna be long enough to cover the previous pieces that we installed. So as you can see, we're fastening it to the front with framing nails, and here's a quick zoom in showing that the front piece is perfectly flush with the side fascia boards. And we're gonna install the back fascia board the exact same way, tacking it in place and installing the partial and then painting there because I forgot to paint beforehand. Now I'm gonna have a dedicated video showing how to install and trim out the windows, but basically you're gonna install trim so that it contacts the window flange and install the sides first in my opinion, and then the bottom and the top. Use framing nails to secure everything. All there's left to do is take care of a few finishing touches. 
So if you were a bonehead like me and installed the trim with screws instead of brad nails, the first finishing touch is to go back and basically fill in any large voids or screw holes or nails that you drove too deep using some caulk. So as you can see there, I'm putting a little bit on and then I'm wiping it flush with my finger. You're also going to want to apply caulk every place where your trim intersects with the siding, basically everywhere that you install trim. And the idea here is you want to caulk that seam to prevent any water from infiltrating behind the trim. So definitely do what you can to caulk all the seams and prevent any water from getting behind. When it comes to caulking, basically just think about how water could infiltrate into your shed and cause a problem. So as you can see, I'm installing the caulk around all three sides of the window. I'm not going to caulk at the bottom in the event that any water does get behind the trim, it'll be able to drain out. So make sure you caulk at least all three sides there. And I'm also caulking between the window and the inside of that trim to make sure no water can get underneath. I then repeated this process for the other shed window. Then I went back and I caulked every piece of trim to make sure no water could get behind it. So although I didn't show all the caulking I did, I basically just caulked along every piece of trim on both sides to prevent any water infiltration and also just to clean up any imperfections. Finally, you're going to want to go back and perform any touch-up paint on the trim. This is going to be painting over any of the caulk, painting any trim that you might have scuffed up. But I tried to use a roller wherever I could and then I went back with a paintbrush to do any of the far-to-reach places. Then I went to the back where I forgot to pre-paint and I took care of that as well. Then just go perform any touch-up work as you see necessary. And the final finishing touch for me was to paint over all of the framing nails I used to secure the fascia boards on the sides and front of the shed. What's up guys? So when I built this modern shed, I used T111 siding for most of the sides of the shed, but I wanted to break up the siding style for something a little more aesthetic for the front and the sides of the shed where we installed sheathing. Now, although I could have installed, you know, uh, vinyl siding or cedar shakes like all the other basic shed builders out there, you know who I'm talking about. I remembered that I had some leftover luxury vinyl plank flooring that I installed in my house. And I got to thinking, can you use LVP flooring as a suitable shed siding? Let's find out. What's up guys? So if you need to learn how to do any of the previous projects like framing the walls or installing the siding, you can check out my previous videos. But in this video, I'm gonna go through my crazy idea to use LVP flooring instead of the traditional vinyl or cedar shakes for my shed siding. So to make this crazy idea a reality, I decided to use liquid nails adhesive and exterior rated brad nails to attach my previously purchased LVP flooring that I used in my house to the shed sheathing. So as you can see, I put construction adhesive on both the sheathing and the back of the LVP plank. And then I went and I put in a good amount of exterior rated brad nails to fasten the plank to the sheathing and the wall studs behind. Now, in addition to the construction adhesive, LVP flooring locks into place with a tongue and groove system. So as you can see here, what you do is you insert the tongue into the groove of the previously installed sheet, as you can see on the left-hand side, and then that is gonna interlock. And then as you slide it into place with the other piece of LVP flooring. You can use either a hammer like you need to use for this piece of flooring, but the kind I used on the shed, it actually just fit into place without the use of a hammer. But you definitely want to make sure that your LVP planks interlock properly for a fully waterproof installation. Here you can see I'm knocking it in place to make sure it's interlocking with the previously installed plank and then I'm fastening it permanently with the brad nails. So here we are and we need to install the first partial piece and in order to cut LVP you have a couple options. First option is just measure your cut length and then transpose that onto the LVP plank and then use a carpenter square and a utility knife to score the edge flip it over and then snap it along the scored edge. The other option, which is a bit more messy, is just to cut it with a miter saw, which is what I did more often than not since I was outside. But again, take your partial sheet that you just cut, install it in place, and you're gonna repeat that around all the intricacies for your shed. Here, I had to cut a little bit off the bottom to get it to fit right there. And sometimes you wanna install and interlock two pieces at once, which I just did. Then fasten it with brad nails. Here I am at the other side doing the exact same process. And as you can see here, I'm measuring the piece that I had to rip off with the circular saw and then installing two pieces at once to make it easy. Also, if you like this video, please drop a like down below and subscribe if you wanna be notified when the rest of the videos in my shed series are released. Now at this point, we're gonna to have to cut the LVP around the windows, which was a little bit tricky, but I just clamped the LVP plank to the table with some bar clamps and then I cut it with a jigsaw, which made it pretty easy. Then I just installed it in place just like we did for all the rest of the planks and then used brad nails to permanently install it. I did this for all of the areas around the windows. It was a little bit cumbersome, but it wasn't too bad once we got the hang of it. As you can see there, I needed to use a hammer and a screwdriver to get the two adjacent panels to interlock. Then I simply went and I installed the rest of the LVP on the front of the wall. 
After finishing the front wall, we repeated the process for the side of the shed on top of the veneer. Here we had to cut along the angle of the roof, which we did with a circular saw, and then it's just a matter of getting the individual planks to interlock and then fastening them again with a construction adhesive and the brad nails. Here I am fastening the last piece on one side. Then just repeated the exact same process for the other side of the shed. Some of the LVP planks were really hard to interlock, so I had to use a crowbar and a hammer to actually get those to set properly. It was a pain in some cases. And here I am moving on to the soffit of the shed, and this was pretty tough as well because as you can imagine you're working upside down on a ladder with adhesive and a brad nailer and I think this is why so many people don't finish the underside of their shed because it kind of sucks. A quick note here, if you need to tap a board to get it to interlock with an adjacent board, you can use a scrap piece and a hammer as kind of a tapping block. That way the groove will fit inside the tongue and you can kind of tap it in without damaging the LVP. And here I am installing the final few pieces of LVP veneer on the underside of the soffit on the front of the shed. Now for the side of the shed here, you can see that I didn't actually cut the pieces of LVP to size. I just let them be a little bit long. Then I simply used a chalk line to mark the cut line along the roof rafter. And then I ran my circular saw along that line upside down. I used a respirator and obviously eye protection here. This was kind of a pain, but it went by pretty quick. In hindsight, I might've just cut them to size beforehand. Now, although LVP is inherently waterproof, I went and I waterproofed all the edges with caulk. I used black caulk around the black trim. And then I used this tan slash almond caulk that I found at Home Depot where the walls met the soffit. And here's a quick look at the final result. Now I understand this is an unconventional approach to shed siding, so definitely leave comments down below about your concerns, comments, thoughts, questions on longevity and how it's holding up. I'll be sure to answer all of those. And if you like this type of content, please drop a like down below, subscribe to the channel if you wanna be notified for my next video, which will be the roll up door installation as you're seeing now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one. Hey, what's up everybody? On today's project, we're gonna install a shed window like this. Let's get into it. What's going on guys? So here's a look at the window and where we stand currently. Obviously, we've already framed the shed wall and we've installed our LP smart siding panels in place. If you're building your own shed and you wanna check out how I completed those projects, you can check out my videos linked in the description below. Now, the first step in a successful shed window installation is to have a rough and opening that was framed properly. So for the next minute or so, I'm gonna explain the basics for framing your window's rough opening. If you already have a window framed, you can skip on to the next section of this video. So if we pull away the siding, here's a look at the wall framing for the window's rough opening. So the anatomy of a shed window's rough and framing consists of things like king studs, cripple studs, the window header, etc. So so feel free to pause the video if some of this terminology is new to you. But what I really want to spend some time on is the actual rough-in opening dimensions for your shed window. So as you can see, I ordered my windows from Amazon. It's a 14 inch by 21 inch window and it has this mounting flange as you can see right there. I'll link this window in the video description in case you wanna check it out. So if you scroll to the bottom here, you'll see that the dimensions are listed as 14 inch by 21 inch and that's shown in multiple locations. And you're typically gonna frame your windows rough opening a half an inch wider and taller than the actual window. So for a 14 inch by 21 inch window, I framed it to 14 and a half inches wide by 21 and a half inches tall as shown. So after planning out your shed windows rough opening, you're gonna start laying out the window components similar to what's shown in this figure. I always recommend that you have your shed window on site so that you can perform a dry fit and make sure that everything's gonna fit perfectly before you permanently fasten everything together. It just makes sense. After confirming fit, go ahead and tack in all of your windows framing with a framing nailer as you're seeing here. If you want even more detailed information on how to frame a shed's window, I have a blog linked in the description as well as a video above that will go through it in a greater level of detail. Also, while we're here, if you wanna drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel, I really would appreciate it. So after lifting the wall into place and installing the side, we can start preparing the window for installation. So the first thing you want to do is take some flashing tape and you want to install it on the bottom of the window's rough opening so that it overlaps on both sides and there's also around a two inch overlap over the top of the window's sill. Next, we're going to take a utility knife and we're going to run it down the inside of the window frame on both sides as shown. After cutting both sides, simply fold the cut section so that it adheres to the window sill. 
After installing the flashing tape on the bottom, we're gonna install flashing tape on the sides of the window. You wanna have an overlap at the top, bottom, and again, around a two inch overhang into the window's rough opening. We're gonna cut that again with the utility knife at the bottom and at the top, running the blade along the window's rough opening. And then we're gonna fold in the cut section so that it adheres to the inside of the window's rough in frame. Repeat this for both sides. Here's a look at the window's rough opening with the flashing tape applied to both sides and the bottom. Once we have the flashing tape installed on three sides, we can think about installing the window. What some people will use is a small shim at the bottom to try to center the window in the opening, but that's optional. So here I am taking the window and I'm positioning it on top of the shim to get a dry fit to make sure everything looks okay. Then I'm shipping the window all the way to one side and I'm gonna mark it and then I'm gonna shift the window all the way to the other side and mark that as well. That way, when I center the window in between those two lines, I'll know I have it perfectly centered within the window's rough opening. Here I am showing a close up of the window pushed all the way to the right and where we have that line. And here's a close up of the window being pushed all the way to the left and showing where we have the line marked. So now it's just a matter of centering the distance between the window and that line on the left and centering the distance between the window and that line on the right so that the gap between the window and the line is the same on both sides. Hopefully you get the point. Next up, I performed a few additional dry fit checks. I wanted to make sure I could get the window plumb on both sides and get it perfectly level. And I also wanted to make sure it was level across the top and what kind of modifications I would need to make. Once I was comfortable, it was time to permanently install this window. To install the shed window, you wanna apply a bead of high quality exterior sealant around the entire perimeter of the window's rough opening. Although you wanna install a good amount of the sealant, you don't wanna to install too much or apply too much, I should say, so that you have squeeze out all over the place that you're gonna to have to wipe down. But apply a nice continuous bead down all four sides of the window's rough opening, as close to the window's rough opening as possible. After applying the sealant to the window's rough opening perimeter, you're gonna take the window and you're gonna to prepare to permanently install it. Press the window's mounting flange up against the siding so that it's firmly embedded within the sealant. At this stage, you're gonna to wanna to try to locate that line on the side of the window and center the window within the window's rough opening. After centering the window left and right, use a level to make sure that your window is plumb and level across the top and bottom. Then take one and a half inch exterior rated screws and mount the window to the shed by going through the window flange perforations and into the rough opening studs of the window. In my personal opinion, I don't think you need to install a screw in every single pre-drilled perforation in the window's mounting flange, but it's always good practice to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Continue to go around the window flange, installing screws through the flange and into the window's rough opening. Repeat this for as many screws as you feel is necessary. When you're tightening the screws, you wanna make sure that you don't over tighten and warp the flange, just tighten it enough so it holds the window in place. And as you can see now, I tried to clean up any excess caulk, but because it was black, it, it just made a mess. I recommend that you use clear sealant for your window installation. I made sure to wipe off any excess that would be visible on the window. Now at this point, we're gonna install the final piece of flashing tape at the top, and you want this to be about four to five inches longer than the width of the window. You're gonna install it so that it overlaps the window flange of the window, and so it overlaps both pieces of flashing tape on the sides by about two inches. Now the manufacturer includes a small lip on the window's mounting flange and this lip shows you exactly where you're going to install the trim around the window. Make sure the flashing tape at the top doesn't go any further down than that lip. Now at this point our window's installed and now we're measuring the trim. You want the trim on the sides to go from the one lip on the top to the bottom lip at the bottom. And at this point we're going to cut our pre-painted PVC three and a half inch trim to size. At this point position the trim so that it's in line with the alignment lips or alignment beads on the vertical and horizontal portion of the window. Then tack it in place with either a framing nailer like I'm doing or you can use exterior rated brad nails. Next position the second piece of vertical trim, make sure it's level all the way across get it aligned with the alignment beads on the windows flange and then tack it in place with framing nails just like we did on the other side. At this point, field measure and cut your trim boards for the bottom and top of the window to size and then simply tack it in place once you're happy with how it looks with either a framing nailer or brad nails. Make sure you use exterior rated screws. Finally, install the last piece of trim at the top of the window. In theory, the piece of trim at the top and the bottom of the window should be the exact same, but it's always good to field verify. 
At this point, take a utility knife and cut off any excess flashing tape that extends out further than the trim. Just run it along the perimeter of the trim with the utility knife and then you'll be able to peel it away. After removing any excess flashing tape on the sides of the window, I moved on to the top and cut off the excess flashing tape by running the utility knife along the window trim and then simply peeling it off. We're gonna to perform touch up paint later, so if some paint comes off, it's not a huge deal. And the last few steps in the shed window installation process is to complete the finishing touches. That is, installing caulk on the top and sides of the window trim. I don't recommend that you install caulk at the bottom in case any water gets entrapped, it's able to drain out. And I also recommend that you use caulk between the bottom window trim and the window flange to prevent water from infiltrating in between the two. Then perform any touch of painting as needed. As you can see here, I needed to clean up the corners there and I put some painter's tape on the shed to prevent painting the siding. And here is a look at the final window result. What's going on everybody? So in this video, I'm gonna show you an inexpensive way to install a shed window. In my case, we're installing some front windows on my shed. And if you already have a shed, great. But if you don't and you need to learn how to build one, you can check out my previous videos in this series, which will show you how to frame the walls, how to install the siding, all that good stuff. So with that being said, let's check out how to build an inexpensive shed window. So I have the results right here. See? 99% of people agree that windows are overpriced. They're very expensive, and in my case, the windows are up high, they're out of reach, and their only real purpose is to let light through and be aesthetic. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm anti-window or anything crazy like that. And I installed actual windows on the sides of the shed where they actually needed an open-close function. And I'm gonna release that video in the next week or so. But for these windows on the front of the shed, we don't need a standard window, and we can save a lot of money by using acrylic or plexiglass instead. Let me show you how I did this. What we're gonna do is take one and a half inch PV trim and we're gonna trim around each window but there's a little bit of a trick and here is what I mean okay so we're doing the windows now and we're gonna do a half an inch reveal so as you can see I have a mark there and then a mark there and then I also marked down a half an inch so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our piece of trim up here and you can see we're gonna move it up to where it's a half an inch down there and then that line corresponds with a half an inch overhang there so we'll line it up on the top, and then we'll do the same thing on the bottom. So as you can see there, it's actually in pretty good shape. And there's that line, so we'll line it up there. And then we have our overhang, and we'll hit it. So if we take a look from the inside of the model, you can see that we have a half inch overhang around the entire edge of the window. This half inch overhang is gonna provide a surface that we can push our window panels into and that it can mount against. So as I mentioned in the field, you're gonna mark a half inch from the top and bottom of each window and then mark a half inch on each piece of trim. Then you're gonna install it in place as you're seeing on each side. I use screws, but you can use brad nails just as easily. You're gonna measure the distance a half an inch up and a half an inch from the bottom, cut the trim to size and then mark the half inch. So here I am after field verifying the distance from both outside edges of trim, and then I'm installing the bottom and top pieces there. Now in hindsight, I probably would have left more of like a three quarter inch or a one inch overhang. That would give me a larger surface to push my plexiglass against. But for now, we did a half inch, we learned from it, but just an FYI if you're gonna do this same method. And at this point, we have the trim installed with a half inch overhang on all three windows. And if you want the dimensions and the plans and the materials list for this exact shed, you can check out my shed build resources in the video description. And here's a look at the window trim installed from the inside. Now, although we framed these windows to be two foot six and a half inch wide by one foot two inches tall, it's always a good idea to field verify each window opening so that we can cut our acrylic or plexiglass windows to the right size. So here I am checking the height and then I'm gonna go and check the horizontal width of the windows and after confirming them, I'm gonna go and actually cut my plexiglass acrylic windows to size. Now, I bought my acrylic panels from Amazon. They literally have a million options you can choose from. Here's the kind I bought. I bought 0 0.03 inch thickness, and honestly, that was too thin. I would go with something more rigid. This worked for me, but if I was gonna do it again, I would get something a bit thicker. So here I am measuring the length and width to fit my window opening. As you can see, the panel right now is blue because it has a protective film on top of it, but I guarantee you that it is absolutely 100% transparent. So I'm making the marks with a Sharpie, then I'm gonna transpose them with a straight edge. And by using the straight edge and the Sharpie, I'm able to give myself a nice straight cut line. Now, although these 0.03 inch panels are extremely flimsy and I would go thicker, the bright side is that you're able to cut these with scissors really easily. 
If you ended up going with a thicker acrylic panel, you're probably gonna need to use a straight edge and a utility knife to score and snap it, or you can cut it with a circular saw, is what I've seen people do. But in my case, I have the super thin panels, so scissors work just fine. So after cutting the panels, I'm performing a dry fit, and once I confirmed that everything looked good, I removed the protective film, and then it was basically time to install. You're gonna have this protective film on both sides of the acrylic panels. At least that's how it was for the ones I bought. So after pulling off the protective film, what I did is I took some liquid nails and really any construction adhesive will do, probably something for the exterior since it's gonna be for a shed, but you're gonna put a bead of this adhesive around the entire perimeter of the shed window. Basically, you wanna put enough adhesive so that the acrylic panel is going to contact the overhang and then permanently be adhered to it, but you don't wanna to put too much to the point where when you push the acrylic panel against the overhang, you're gonna have a bunch of the adhesive squeeze out that you're gonna to have to wipe off later. So apply enough, but don't put too much. And I was holding the camera while I applied that adhesive, so give me a break on how messy it was. But now I'm taking the panel and I'm gonna put it in place and push it up so that it contacts the half inch overhang that we have on all four sides of the window. As you can see, I'm pushing with a little bit of pressure to make sure that that acrylic panel is fully set and pushed against the adhesive. Then I'm going on the outside of the shed and I'm gonna clean up any of the adhesive squeeze out that I have to make sure that's not gonna dry on the outside of the window and create a unprofessional look. After cleaning up any excess construction adhesive on the outside, make sure that the inside looks good as well. Now at this point, I moved on to the second window. I already applied construction adhesive here to the overhang and then I put the panel in place, cleaned up any of the excess construction adhesive from the inside, then the outside, and then I went back and cleaned up any from the inside again. It's pretty iterative, but you don't wanna have any excess glue stuck to your windows. It just looks bad. So here I am moving on to the third window. I'm cutting it to size just like we did for the other two and then I'm dry fitting it in place just like we did before. Then I'm gonna apply construction adhesive as you can see me doing from the inside there. And here's a look at the bead of construction adhesive we applied to the half inch overhang from the inside view of the shed. As you can see, just a nice little bead around the entire perimeter. With the construction adhesive in place, it's time to take our panel and push it up against the half inch overhang while also embedding the panel in the construction adhesive to give us a nice clean installation. After cleaning up any of the excess construction adhesive, simply give it a few hours to dry. So although I'm overall happy with how the acrylic window panels on the front of my shed turned out, there were a few lessons learned. If I was doing this again, I would definitely use a thicker acrylic panel. I feel like when I use this really flimsy panel, it worked, but it deformed a little bit. And then when the light hits it a certain way, I feel like it kind of looks like a fun house. It's just a little bit off. So I would use a thicker panel if I was doing this again. Second, I would give myself a bigger overhang, probably three quarter of an inch, just for a little bit more support and rigidity. I will say there was a bird that got caught in this shed and it was trying to fly out and it kept on hitting the windows and they didn't break, they held up really good. But another thing you could do is you could take a piece of blocking and just install it behind the window acrylic panel. That way, in addition to the adhesive, you have a piece of wood behind it to kind of keep it in place. But those are my tips. What is going on everybody? So in this episode of the Modern Shed Build series, we're gonna be installing the roll-up door on the front of the shed. And although roll-up doors are a little pricey, I think the look is well worth it. Let's get into the video. Now, if you missed any previous videos like how to frame the shed, you can check out my channel. But first, let's talk about ordering the door. You're gonna to need to determine your rough opening, which is the width and the height. And you might also come across terms like left hand and right hand jam, as well as the header, which goes above your door. You're gonna to need to order a roll up door based on your rough opening dimensions. In my case, I have a six foot wide door by a seven foot tall door. So using the rough and dimensions, you can go to a website like Steel Door Depot. You can plug in your rough opening dimensions and then select your colors, things like that. Be sure to pay attention to the manufacturer's instructions on ordering the right door for your application. Here's the info on the door I ordered. I ordered Silhouette Gray and the shipping is like 300 bucks. So if you can pick up from a local supply warehouse, I would recommend you do it. Now, if your shed's roll-up door gets delivered, it should arrive in a crate like this. And obviously the first step is to open that up and then get your roll-up door components positioned inside your shed. It's gonna come with the main barrel door right there, which is the curtain and also the legs, which you see on the floor in the shed. Now, the first step in the roll-up door installation is to attach the curtain barrel to the guides. Use the provided hardware, which will consist of a few bolts and nuts to connect the curtain barrel to the guides. So we got it positioned right there preliminarily. 
After attaching the guide to the curtain barrel on one side of the roll-up door, move on to the other side and repeat the exact same process, using the provided hardware and adjusting the curtain barrel as needed to get the bolt through both the guide and the curtain barrel bracket. And once you get a position where it needs to be, thread the bolt through and then thread the nut on the other side. And hand tighten for now and we'll go back later on and tighten it up with a socket wrench. So after hand tightening the hardware, go back with a socket wrench and tighten everything up to the point where it's tight and then an additional quarter turn. And do this for all bolts that are used to connect the guides to the curtain barrel bracket as you're seeing there. This should be four bolts total. And here's a look at the guides attached to the barrel curtain. And I'm showing that up close right now on both sides, showing the connection before we lift it up into place. Now, before lifting the roll-up door into place, you want to have the guides positioned against the left-hand jam and the right-hand jam as shown. You want to have a person positioned holding each guide, and then you want to lift it in place along the pivot point as shown. Here I am with my brother, and we're each going to grab one of the guides, and we're going to slowly lift the entire roll-up door into place. As we lift it, you'll see that the guides are going to pivot along the pivot point which is where the left hand and right hand jam intersect with the guide. We made this look a lot more awkward than it needed to, but essentially you and your helper are gonna walk the door up into place until the guides contact the left hand and right hand jam. What I'm showing here is a section view of how it would look as you lift the guide into place and as it contacts the jam. So after preliminarily lifting the roll up door into place, we took some bar clamps and we secured the jams temporarily to the front of the shed as you're seeing. We did this on both sides to hold it in place and then we're gonna go back and we're gonna permanently install them to the inside of the rough opening with the lag bolts and screws provided with the roll up door. Okay, so we put this in place and we used clamps to temporarily hold it. As you can see, we have it up on the top right there. Again, we have a clamp on both sides. At this point, you want to make sure that the opening width at the top of the door is the same as the opening width at the bottom. Use a tape measure to check the distance at the top first. This distance should be indicative of what you need since the barrel brackets will keep the guides as far apart as they need to be. The equipment manufacturer will also give you a dimension from outside of the first guide to outside of the second guide, and usually this is about three and a half inches greater than the rough opening width. So compare your guide spacing with the manufacturer provided dimensions. Do that at the top. And then after confirming that you look good at the top, confirm that you have the same distance at the bottom. The idea here is you want the width between the guides to be the same for the entire height of the roll up door track. After confirming that the width between the guides is the same at the top and the bottom, you can go ahead and actually attach your guides to the wall studs of the shed. When you order your roll-up door, you can get mounting for studs that are made of wood, you can get metal mounting brackets, but here we're simply gonna be installing the provided hardware that came with the door and attaching it to the rough opening frame of the door. There's a two by four stud that we're gonna be anchoring the guides into. Use the provided hardware to attach the door guides to the studs behind through all of the perforations in the guides. There should be one at the bottom, one in the middle, one at the top, and you're gonna attach these to the actual shed frame for all of the opening locations. A pretty redundant process, but make sure you take care of this and fasten the guides firmly to the door's rough opening frame. At this point, we're gonna set the initial spring tension for the door, and to do this, we're gonna give the door barrel two full revolutions towards the door opening. In other words, you're gonna rotate the door as if you were sending the curtain down through the guides. After giving it two full revolutions, you're gonna remove the plastic wrap around the door, and we can begin to move the curtain down into the guides. So after removing all of the protective foam from the curtain, grab the end of the curtain and pull it down into the guide track. Do this slowly, make sure that you're within the guides on both sides of the door's rough opening, and then simply thread the curtain down through the guides until you get to the bottom. 
Okay, so at this point, we're gonna put the handle on and we're gonna do this, you know, obviously before we go all the way to the bottom, it's easier to do. So what we're doing now is we're using the provided hardware to fasten the door handle to the roll-up door, follow the manufacturer's instructions, and here we are going to the sides of the door, and we're installing a stop clip right there. So what this clip is going to do, it's going to prevent the door when we open it up from going too far up and curling up into the curtain because it's going to actually contact a piece of metal stop that we're going to put in at the top. Here's a look at how that clip is gonna contact the door stop. And here we are installing the door clip on the other side of the door, and there's a second stop on this side. So the door will catch on both sides of the door. After installing all the hardware, give your door a couple tests by opening and closing the curtain. You wanna assess the tension to see if any adjustments are needed to get the tension right for your specific roll-up door. Obviously, follow the manufacturer's instructions for adjusting the tension, but in my case, I found that there was a bit too much tension in my roll-up door. So to adjust the tension, you're gonna lift up that prawl right there, and to release tension, you're gonna lift that wheel upward, and in our case, we were relieving tension, so we lifted upward, but if you wanted more tension in the door, you would rotate that wheel downward. Here I am giving it another test, and after testing it, I found that there was still a bit too much tension, so I'm gonna go back and relieve a little bit more of the tension. All right, so to adjust our tension here, we gotta adjust this little clip. So first, I'm gonna loosen it ever so slightly, just so I can get this open, and then I'm gonna slightly adjust that there take some of the tension out and after testing it i was happy with the tension in the roll-up door so i left it there the door will also likely come with a pull string that you can install if you have a door that's up high and you can't reach What's going on everybody? So in this episode of the Modern Shed Build series, we're gonna be installing asphalt shingles on a shed roof. This video is gonna be pretty detailed. It's gonna go through how to install the drip edge, how to cut your starter strip, how to install the rows of shingles, how to install ridge flashing, all that good stuff. So skip around as you need. It's gonna be very detailed, but with that being said, let's get into the video. What's going on guys? So if you still need to frame your shed walls or your shed roof, you can check out my previous videos. But this project starts with the plywood roof decking already installed. And as you can see, I apply flashing tape to all of the plywood joints. This isn't necessary, but it's what I did. And as we install the asphalt shingles, you'll be hearing these terms a lot. So the front of the shed is referred to as the ridge. The sides of the shed roof are called the rake and the backside is called the eave. The first step in this asphalt shingle installation procedure is to install the drip edge on the back also known as the eave of the shed roof. Now, a drip edge is typically made of a non-corrosive metal, and its purpose is to direct any water runoff away from the shed. I'll link the exact drip edge I used in the description. When installing a drip edge on the eave side, I recommend that you take some snippers and create a bend just for a couple inches at the corner, and this is gonna basically create a corner that's gonna catch between the eave and the rake edge, and that way when you install the rake drip edge, it will go on top of that and prevent any water from getting behind the drip edge. So bend that corner in place, and once you get it positioned where it needs to be, tight up against that outside corner, you're gonna install nails every 12 inches on center. I'm using the rigid roofing nailer, and I'll link that in the description. I also installed a nail at the corner to keep the bent portion in place. I needed two pieces of drip edge to span the total distance, so I created that bent corner piece just like we did on the other side, and then you're gonna overlap the second piece of drip edge with the first drip edge by a minimum of six inches. Typically, you can get two pieces of drip edge to nest together pretty well by tapping it with a hammer. As you can see, I had the corner up flush, and then once everything was good and I had that six inch overlap, I nailed everything in place every 12 inches on center or so. As you can see, I have the bent portion there that looks good. And just like the other side, I'm gonna install a nail to make sure that that bent portion stays locked in place. Here's a quick preliminary look at the eave drip edge installed all along the eave side of the shed. And now we can begin installing the tar paper. Tar paper is a thin layer of waterproof material that serves as a waterproof barrier between the plywood roof decking below and the shingles above. Install your first row of tar paper so that it overhangs the eave side drip edge by around an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. Make sure that the overlap is consistent all the way across. 
After positioning your tar paper so the desired overhang is maintained, use either staples or cap nails with a rubber head to secure the tar paper in place. Be sure to use enough nails or staples to secure the tar paper. After installing the first row of tar paper, we're going to install the second row so that it overlaps the first row by a minimum of four inches. Yeah. You want to have this overlap so if water ever gets on top of the tar paper, it will be able to drain freely down the roof and off the shed. Continue to install row after row of tar paper, maintaining the minimum four inch overlap up the entire shed. As you install the tar paper, don't be afraid to have an overhang over the rake sides and also the ridge. You can go back later on and trim it flush to the fascia boards using a utility knife, and that is so much easier than trying to pre-measure and pre-cut your tar paper to length. After installing the tar paper so that it goes on top of the eave side drip edge, you're now going to install the drip edge over top of the tar paper on the rake sides of the shed. Take your first piece of drip edge for the rake side and position it on the back side of the shed. You want to make sure that the rake drip edge overlaps the eave drip edge on that piece that we bent previously. Be sure to pull the drip edge in so it's flush with the fascia board and secure it every 12 inches on center. So after installing the first piece of drip edge on the rake side of the shed, we're gonna take the second piece and we wanna make sure that we cut it to a length that's gonna allow for a six inch overhang over the previously installed piece of drip edge. So after measuring that, I'm taking my snippers there and I'm cutting the drip edge along that line. And then I'm gonna position the second piece of rake drip edge on top of the first piece of rake drip edge so that I have a six inch overlap and also so that the front near the ridge is perfectly flush with the ridge fascia board as shown. Once I have everything in place, I I secured it with a nail, made sure that the two pieces of rake drip edge interlocked properly, and then secured them in place every 12 inches on center. Repeat this exact process for the other rake side of the shed. After installing the drip edge on the eave side of the shed, then the tar paper, and then the drip edges on the rake sides of the shed, we can now begin installing the shingles. The first step in installing shingles is to install the starter strip on the eave side of the shed. Now, although you can buy pre-made starter strip, it's often a lot more economical for things like a shed where you only need a few starter strips to simply make your own. So to do this, flip a full shingle over and then cut it in half lengthwise as shown. Here I am taking another shingle and repeating the process by flipping it over, taking a utility knife and cutting the shingle in half lengthwise. Now, we're only gonna use the half of this shingle that has the adhesive backing like I'm showing here. That adhesive is gonna help to hold the shingle course that we install on top of it down in place. I needed four starter strips for this shed, so I cut the remaining two as shown. Cut approximately four inches off the first piece of starter strip so that the joints between the shingle course above and the starter strip don't line up. Position the first starter strip in place so that it overlaps the rake drip edge by around a quarter of an inch and also overlaps the eave drip edge by a quarter of an inch. After positioning the starter strip with an appropriate overhang, secure it in place with four nails. Then install the next piece of starter strip, ensuring that you have the correct overhang, and then using four nails to hold it in place. Repeat this process for the rest of the starter strip along that first row. Don't be afraid to leave an overhang of starter strip over the rake edge. We'll go back and trim that off later. So after installing the starter strip, what we're gonna do now is install our first course of shingles. So typically you want your first course of shingles to overhang your starter strip by about a quarter of an inch. And to ensure that I get a consistent quarter inch overhang, I like to establish where I'm gonna install the back of the shingle. So for these shingles, they're 13 and a quarter inches. So if I mark 13 inches from the back of the starter strip, that will mean once I install the shingle flush with that line, I'll get a quarter inch overhang. Hope that makes sense. So to install the first shingle, we're taking a full length run of shingle and we're gonna line it up so that the back of the shingle is right up against the chalk line that we established. What this is gonna mean is that we're gonna have a quarter inch overhang over the starter strip and you also wanna position the shingle so you have a quarter inch overhang over the rake side drip edge. Once you have your first shingle in the first row position, so you have the quarter inch overhang over the starter strip and a quarter inch overhang over the rake side drip edge, you're gonna install four nails into the target nail zone as shown in the figure. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions, but if you live in the high wind zone, you may wanna install six nails per shingle. Continue to install the first row of shingles by positioning the back of the shingle so it's in line with the chalk line established previously, and then install four nails if you live in a standard area, or six nails if you live in a high wind area, installing the nails within the target nail zone as shown. Here I am installing the final shingle in the first row, getting it flush with the adjacent shingle and making sure it's in line with the chalk line, and then installing nails as shown. Again, the overhang is fine, we'll trim that off later. Here's a look at the first row of shingles completed. So when installing the first shingle in the second row, what you're gonna do is you're gonna trim six inches off of the length. 
And the reason you're going to do this is because you want all of the joints between shingles to be staggered for each row. After trimming six inches off the first shingle in the second row, you're going to want to position it so again you have the quarter inch overhang over the rake side drip edge and so that the bottom of the shingle is in line with the top of the wide cutout. What I'm showing you here is how in the field, the bottom of the shingle installed above should be completely lined up with the wide cutout of the shingle below, as shown. So after positioning the first shingle in the second row so that the quarter inch overhang is maintained on the rake side drip edge, and so the bottom of the shingle is in line with the top of the wide cutout of the shingle below, you can then install your roofing nails, install four for standard applications in the target nail zone, and use six nails if you're in a high wind zone. And here I am showing you how I'm maintaining a quarter inch overhang over the rake side drip edge. So at this point, we're simply gonna continue with the installation of the second row of shingles. We're gonna butt the second shingle up against the first shingle we installed in the second row. We're gonna make sure that the bottom of the shingle is in line with the wide cutout of the shingle below. And then we're gonna drive four or five nails in the target nail zone to secure it in place, making sure that it's lined up where it needs to be. Continue to install full shingles in the second row until you make it all the way across the row. Leave any overhang and we'll trim that later. Now for the first shingle in the third row, we're gonna trim 11 inches off this time. And again, this is just to stagger the joints in between the shingles. So taking our first shingle for the third row, which has 11 inches trimmed off, we started and maintained the quarter inch overhang and we installed the shingles the same way all the way across. For the fourth row of shingles, we're gonna trim 17 inches off this time. After this fourth course, the fifth course is simply gonna use a full shingle again and we're gonna repeat this process using a full shingle, then trimming six inches off, then trimming 11 inches off, then trimming 17 inches off, and then restarting. So repeat this process all the rest of the way up. So at this point, you have all the knowledge you need to continue to install row after row of shingles. Be sure to maintain a quarter inch overhang over the rake drip edges and continue to leave an overhang on the opposite rake side of the shed. At this point, I'll let the time lapse roll for your benefit Feel free to skip ahead, but essentially we're following the exact same process. We're gonna be trimming the first shingle in each row according to the manufacturer's instructions and to make sure that we have a staggered joint. And then we're just gonna install the shingles all the way across each row. As you can see, I have a broom up there on the roof so I can sweep off any dirt, debris, or leaves so I have a clean surface to install my shingles on. So after cleaning off the surface, here's just a quick example of me installing a shingle from below. I'm getting it pushed up against the shingle to the left, and then I'm making sure that the bottom of the shingle is in line with the top of the wide cutout of the shingle below. Once I had it positioned where I wanted it on the left-hand side, I used a roofing nail to secure it. Then I made any adjustments necessary on the right-hand side, and once I was happy with it, I nailed it in place. I'm gonna put a few more nails in the target nail zone. And here's a quick look showing the six inch stagger between the row below. So what I'm gonna show here is the installation of the first shingle in one of the rows towards the top of the shed. And it's just more of the same. We're gonna position it so we have the quarter inch overhang over the rake drip edge. And we're just gonna lower that shingle in place so that it's in line with the top of the wide cutout of the shingle below. And then it's just as simple as nailing it in place just like we've done. Here I am showing the overhang that we're maintaining. At this point, I'm gonna to continue to install rows of shingles until we get to the ridge of the shed. There we'll do something a little bit different, but for now it's row after row until we get there. So this was the last row of shingles that I was able to install where I could actually nail through the target nail zone. So after installing this row, I took my ladder and I accessed the shingles from below and I used a utility knife with a hook blade to cut it flush with the fascia board on the ridge edge of the shed. So in order to cover this last row of nails, what I did was I took a bunch of asphaltic uh, roof coating and I used this as a type of adhesive and then I took another row of shingles and I installed it pretty similar to how you would install any row, but the only difference is I nailed it through the shingle as far as I could up towards the ridge and still secure it to the fascia board. 
Now we're gonna have these exposed nails, but we're gonna install a piece of flashing over the corner there, which is gonna cover those nails. So it's not a big deal. So what I did again is I put a bunch of that asphaltic coating down. I took the shingle, I installed it in place, and I nailed it as far up towards the front of the shed as I possibly could while still contacting the wooden fascia board. Then as you can see, I'm taking some of that asphaltic coating and I'm putting it over the nail heads and spreading it out with my finger just as an additional layer of water protection. So here I am continuing down the last row. Again, I'm installing a copious amount of this asphaltic coating, which I'm kind of using as an adhesive. And then I'm taking a full row of shingles. I'm installing it in place so that the bottom of that shingle row is still flush with the top of the wide cutout of the shingles below. And then I'm going back and I'm covering all the nail heads with that asphaltic coating. After completing the last row on the shed, I went down to the underside of the shed and I scored off the excess with a utility knife so that it was flush with the fascia board as you're seeing right now. After completing this step, it's time to install the ridge flashing which will cover up that last row. So what I'm showing you here is this 90 degree ridge flashing that's gonna go over the last row of shingles and also the fascia board on the front. So you can buy these either in the aluminum color or you can buy them black. Um, they're hard to find in black sometimes, but you can always paint them. So what I'm doing is I'm applying two beads of this asphaltic coating, and I'm doing this on both sides of the piece of ridge flashing. This asphaltic coating will help to adhere the ridge flashing to the shed, and it also will be a waterproofing agent. Continue to apply this asphaltic coating on both sides of the ridge flashing all the way down the entire length. At this point, you're going to want to take your ridge flashing with the asphaltic coating already applied to the backside, and you're going to want to position it in place on the ridge of the roof. As you can see, this piece of angled ridge flashing is going to overlap and cover the nails that we used to install that last row of shingles. And what we're going to do on the left hand side is you want to position that ridge flashing so that it overlaps the drip edge. You want to make sure that it covers the drip edge on the rake side so that any water can't get behind the drip edge on the rake side. Once you have a position in place and have the front side flush against the fascia board, you're going to nail it every 12 inches on center, attaching it securely to the sheathing and hopefully the 2x6 fascia board below. You're going to want to make sure that you apply nails every 12 inches on center to secure this piece of ridge flashing, and we're going to do this all the way till the end of that one piece of ridge flashing. After installing nails every 12 inches on center for the first piece of ridge flashing, you're gonna wanna take a little bit more of that asphaltic coating and apply it to the nail heads used to secure the ridge flashing to the shed. This is gonna fully waterproof all of those nail head connections and make sure your roof never leaks, or hopefully never. Continue to apply asphaltic coating to all of the nail heads used to secure the ridge flashing to the shed roof. Use your finger to spread it around and make sure that you fill all of the voids around the nail head. So unfortunately, I couldn't buy a piece of ridge flashing that spanned the entire length of the shed. So I have to apply a partial piece on the other side of the shed. So what I did is I applied a good bit of asphaltic coating to the previously installed ridge flashing. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure so I have at least a minimum of about a six inch overlap between the first piece of ridge flashing and the second piece that I'm applying. Once I had that six inch overlap, I went to the other side with some snippers and I cut it so that it was flush with the drip edge. If anything, you wanna have the ridge flashing a little bit further extending than the drip edge, just to make sure that no water will ever get behind the drip edge on the rake edge. After cutting it to size, you're simply gonna apply some more asphaltic coating underneath, which I didn't show. And once you have it in place, you're gonna use nails to secure it to the shed. For this smaller piece of ridge flashing, I nailed it to the shed every eight inches on center or so. And then after applying nails all the way across as far over as I could go, I took my asphaltic coating and I applied it to the nail heads all the way across. Again, the purpose of this coating is to seal the nail heads, fully waterproofing that ridge flashing installation. So after installing the ridge flashing, we're gonna go back and we're gonna trim off any of the excess shingles that's overhanging the rake side of the shed. Next up, you want to mark a quarter inches over from the drip edge on the rake edge, and then you're going to snap a chalk line so you know where to trim the overhanging shingles. So here I am establishing the chalk line, which will leave me with a quarter inch overhang over the rake drip edge, and I couldn't show myself snapping it, but you're going to snap that along the top of the shingles. Then go back with a hook blade on your utility knife and trim all of the excess off. 
You can also use some heavy duty snippers to cut off the overhanging shingles, but this is not recommended. I think a utility blade is the best way to go. After trimming off any of the overhanging shingles, your shed roof asphalt shingle installation is now complete. What is going on everybody? So in this video, I'm gonna run through how I built a ramp for the modern shed you're seeing now. Overall, I think building a shed ramp is a pretty easy project. I think anyone can do this. Let's get going. The first step in building a shed ramp is to determine the width of your ramp. My rough end opening for the door is six foot, so I'm gonna build my ramp at six foot width so that it matches that rough opening. Speaking of which, if you wanna learn how I built this shed or you want the actual course material, you can check out my previous videos or the link in the description. So after determining your shed ramp width, you're gonna cut the ledger board and the bottom support brace as shown to your desired shed ramp width, six feet in my case. All shed ramp lumber should be pressure treated since it'll be in contact with the ground. And here I am showing how we have both pieces cut and positioned in place. Okay, so at this point, you wanna start thinking about how far away from the shed you want your ramp to go. So based on my slope, it's very minor. So what I decided was to come out to about 28 inches. And when you actually decide on your final length, what you wanna do is think about the width of the decking board that you're gonna be installing in place. And for my ramp, I'm using some leftover composite decking that I had from my deck, and this is five and a half inch width. So basically, I want the total length of my ramp to be a multiple of those boards, plus the spacing in between them. So like with all projects, begin with the end in mind, and the more planning you do ahead of time, the easier it's gonna be as you progress with the project. So at this point, I cut all of my joists to size as shown. In my case, I have a six foot ramp, so I decided to use five joists. You wanna have the spacing around 16 inch on center maximum, in my opinion. So plan out how many joists you'll need and then cut them to size. After getting one cut, I just use it as a template to cut all the rest to the exact same size. So at this point, let's talk about the shed ramp angle. So in my opinion, I think you should just go out there and find the angle by trial and error. And what I mean by that is take a scrap piece of lumber and use your miter saw to cut a few different angles. Try one that's pretty steep, like at 25 degrees. Try one that's pretty shallow at like 10 degrees and take that angled board that you cut and put it up against the ledger board on your shed. You'll have a lot of variability with the angle you choose. And obviously it depends on what kind of angle you have going out. Mine's obviously very shallow. So what I'm showing here, it's kind of like a five to eight degree angle. And you can see that's actually pretty close to what I want. It'll kind of come out and here. Obviously, if you've got further to go down, you can cut a steeper angle. This is a 25 degree angle. And as you can see, that would need to be like that to be flush. So you have a lot of, I guess, adjustability. You can obviously excavate down to make it work. So this isn't really an exact science, but get an idea of how far out you want it to stick, get an idea of the angle, and then you can do a couple dry fits. So mine's definitely gonna be closer to these eight degrees there. And here I am showing how a couple test angles fit against the ledger board. And as you can see, that's a steeper 25 degree angle, but on the other side, I cut an eight degree angle, and that seems to be perfect for the slope of the ramp that I need. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and adjust my chop saw to eight degrees, because eight is what I found to be the best for mine. And after adjusting the miter saw to eight degrees, I went and I made that eight degree cut on the very edge of each of the joists. The idea here is that you're not cutting any length off the longest portion, but you're just gonna cut that angle. So I did that for all five of my joists. Now at this point, I'm trying to match that angle on the other side, and I took a kind of unique approach to this. I just decided to mark an inch and a half down from the top of each of the joists, and that's gonna serve as our reference line for the next step. Okay, so we have our mark right here. Now, because we have eight degrees, we have an eight degree angle cut on this side, I want to try and match that here. So the way to do this is I'm gonna take my carpenter square and I'm gonna put the pivot point, which is here, right on that line. And now, this right here, as you can see, is at 70 degrees. And then I'm just gonna rotate it eight degrees. So this is 70, we'll rotate it at 75, 76, 77, 78. And that's gonna put me at 78 degrees, which is an eight degree angle, which will match what we have on the other end. And the carpenter square wasn't quite long enough, so I grabbed a framing square to make that mark all the way across. I then repeated this process for all five of the joists. After marking the eight degree cut line, I used some bar clamps to secure the joists to the table and then used a circular saw to cut all five of the joists along that cut line. 
When cutting these shed ramp joists, it might be a good idea to use bar clamps like I did. It just helps to hold them in place while you make the cuts with your circular saw. So at this point, the joists are cut and we can now begin assembling all of the shed ramp components. So I attached the outermost joist to the ledger board first and I used three inch exterior rated screws, two screws per connection to go through the back of the ledger board and into the outermost joist. You might find that pre-syncing the screws is helpful because you're gonna wanna make sure that the top of the joist is perfectly flush with the top of the ledger board. After attaching the two outermost floor joists to the ledger board, I put some shims underneath the ledger board so that I could rotate the ramp assembly to match the angle for the bottom support brace. Once I got it matched and flush, I used two screws per connection. Again, these are three inch exterior rated screws, making sure that it's perfectly flush with the outside of that bottom support brace. Then I just went back and I spaced the joists evenly. I went in the middle first, two screws per connection, and then I did that for the remaining two floor joists as you can see. Here's a view showing how I'm getting the joist perfectly flush with the top of the ledger board and then using two screws per connection to fasten everything in place. After assembling the shed ramp frame, go ahead and grab the frame and preliminarily position it in place on the front of the shed. And the goal here is to get the ledger board for the ramp to sit flush against the shed base frame. And in my case, I had to excavate a little bit in order to get the ledger board to sit flush against the shed base frame. And this is why building a shed ramp is nice because you can excavate and make tweaks to make everything work. After getting it excavated properly, getting it flush, I then compacted the soil with a four x four. Then I performed one final dry fit to make sure the ledger board was fitting perfectly flush against the shed base frame, which it was. And what I'm showing here is that I over excavated in a few places. And what you wanna do is you wanna apply some stone and the stone is one gonna help to protect the shed ramp from being in direct contact with the soil. And it's also easier to level and easier to compact. Use a level to make sure that everything is level all the way across your shed ramp and add or remove stone as necessary. Also check the back ledger board to make sure that's perfectly level as well. Now, when attaching the ledger board to your shed base frame, you wanna attach it so that whatever decking board you're using is perfectly flush with the shed subfloor. So here, I'm making sure it's flush and I'm gonna install my ledger board so that it accommodates the total thickness of that board. So at this point, I used a bunch of three inch exterior rated screws to secure the ledger board to the shed base frame, ensuring it's level as I went. So after securing the shed ramp ledger board to the shed base frame, I cut all of my composite decking to the required length. That's six foot in this case. So at this point, we're taking our first decking board, which is cut six foot in length, and then we're gonna slide it up so that it is in direct contact with the shed subfloor as you're seeing now. As you can see, there's minor lip between the two, and once we tie it down, it'll be even better. So after getting the decking board positioned properly, I I used two screws per connection to each joist and I made sure the spacing was uniform between the shed subfloor and the decking board. It's about a sixteenth of an inch gap. Install the screws so that they're flush or slightly recessed into the decking boards. Continue to install all of your decking boards to the joist using two screws per connection to each joist. I then backfilled any gaps with some leftover stone and then applied some topsoil before planting grass seed. Here's a look at the final result. If you want to learn how to take electricity and add it to your shed, then you're in the right place. This video is going to help you to plan out your shed's electrical layout. It'll show you how to actually route your conduit from your main electrical breaker to your shed. I'm going to talk about how deep you're going to need to excavate depending on what type of conduit and cable you're using. And I'm also going to give you a preview of the switches, the lights, the outlets, and everything you can install within your shed. So if you need electricity in your shed, make sure to watch this video all the way through. Let's get into it. So in my opinion, the first step in adding electricity to a shed is just to call a local electrician, meet with them at your house, and figure out the best way to route electricity to the shed. So typically your shed's electrical is gonna be pulled directly from your home's main panel, but talk with the electrician and see what they think. Okay, so this project starts with my electrician. He went and he added a circuit for the shed and he ran it around and then it basically goes outside the house if we go outside, he left it coiled up right there. So this is where the project starts. We're gonna be running it to the shed. All right, first things first, we're just gonna make sure it's off, should be. After confirming the circuit was flipped off, I took a half inch drill bit and I drilled through the blocking underneath my deck. These holes were created so that I could run the three quarter inch PVC conduit through the blocking and connect it to my house, as you're seeing now. Next, I took the 12-2 Romex cable that was coiled up outside my home and I threaded it through that first stick of three-quarter inch PVC conduit. 
After getting all of the Romex cable through, I took the piece of conduit and I inserted it into the house and sealed it with some caulk. So at this point, I threaded the cable through the first stick of conduit and I have the end right there. And before doing anything else with that conduit, I'm gonna install a piece of blocking, which is gonna allow me to take the conduit from below the deck put a 90 degree bend on and then get it below grade. So after making my measurements, I cut my PVC conduit to size. You can use a miter saw or a hacksaw. And here I am preparing to make the first connection to PVC conduit. You can see there's a bell end fitting and a plane end fitting. You're gonna apply the conduit glue, which is similar to how you would join PVC pipe. And then you're just gonna push one end into the other and hold it there for a few seconds until it dries. Next up, we're gonna make the transition from horizontal conduit to vertical conduit, and I'm installing a 90 degree bend fitting to accomplish that. Next up, we're gonna install our GFCI outlet, and to do this, we're using one of these exterior rated outlet boxes. I'll link it in the description, and you're gonna attach the mounting clips to both sides and fill any conduit openings that you're not gonna use. In our case, we don't need the one in the middle since we're gonna be going in through the top and out through the bottom. They have these threaded connection fittings where you can connect from the outlet box to the conduit incoming and outgoing. Then you're simply going to apply your PVC cement and you're going to attach the conduit to the outlet box. On the top right there, you can see that we have the 12-2 Romex cable coming out through the top. And then what we're going to do is actually attach the GFCI outlet box to the piece of blocking we installed previously. After installing the incoming conduit, I'm installing the outgoing conduit and I have the UFB cable, which we'll talk about in a second, being threaded down through that piece of conduit. And although you can do this later, I decided just to wire up my GFCI outlet now. You can look up tutorials on YouTube for how to install an outlet, but it's black to black, which is the hot. Then you have your neutral, which is white to white, and then attach your ground. And here we are installing the exterior rated cover. Now the outgoing piece of conduit from that GFCI box is gonna be routed below grade. And this is where we need to start planning and actually excavating to the required depth. So you have many different conduit and cable options when running electrical cable below grade and the type of conduit slash cable you're gonna be using will determine the buried depth you'll need. As always, consult with a licensed electrician and consult with all applicable electrical building codes to get the requirements for your specific area. To illustrate the different burial depths depending on the conduit you're using, let's take rigid metal conduit for example. If you're using rigid metal conduit, you only need to bury your conduit six inches below grade. However, if you plan on using PVC conduit, you'll need to bury your conduit 12 inches below grade. Note that 12 inch burial of PVC conduit is contingent on the following. The cable within the PVC conduit must be GFCI protected before it's routed below grade. And two, the circuit must be limited to 120 volts and be protected by no more than a 20 amp circuit breaker. In my area, if you meet both of those requirements, you can bury your PVC conduit 12 inches below grade. There's also a certain type of cable called UFB that can be directly buried below grade with no conduit. This type of cable must be buried a minimum of 24 inches below grade, but it is an option if you don't feel like using conduit. For my specific shed application, we're gonna be using PVC conduit, so we need to excavate down a minimum of 12 inches. And to excavate for my conduit, I used a post hole digger and a shovel. Also real quick, if you wanna learn how I actually built this shed, you can check out my other videos or check the link in the description. All right, so according to code, we gotta be about a foot in the ground as you can see we're just over a foot here and we're a foot into the ground at every location so after excavating down i started to dry fit all the conduit in place measuring it and cutting it to size here you can see i'm installing a 90 degree bend and you're basically going to want to dry fit all of your conduit in place before you glue anything and it's basically just like a puzzle to get everything to fit together so after dry fitting all the conduit, you can see here that I'm threading the UFB cable through the individual PVC segments. And you don't need to use UFB cable if you're gonna install it in conduit, but I just kind of went with the belt and suspenders approach. And as you can see here, I'm now attaching the 90 degree bends and these two 90 degree bends are back to back. And you can see that I'm still kind of struggling to pull the cable through. So make sure that you pull the cable through as you go so you don't end up having a situation where you have a bunch of bends and you're not able to pull it through. Here I am installing a conduit clip to hold that vertical piece of conduit in place and now once you've dry fit everything you're just going to go back you're going to apply the conduit pvc cement and you're going to glue all of the fittings together as you can see right there i have a coupling to attach that straight run of pvc conduit to the 90 degree bend and as i mentioned before i highly recommend that you thread the cable through as you go it's harder than you would think to actually pull that cable through so working piecemeal is what i recommend 
And after installing all of the PVC conduit 12 inches below grade, it's time to 90 degree bend upward and come out through the ground and connect to the shed. So for my electrical conduit layout, I decided to route my conduit into the shed on the side near the front. So I drilled a three quarter inch hole through as you're seeing now. And just like before, I'm gonna use a tape measure to measure the distance I need to cover with the conduit. Then I'm gonna dry fit everything and make my cuts just as before. I'll link all of the specific PVC fittings I'm using in the description. And after dry fitting everything in place, you're gonna glue all the PVC components together with the PVC cement. And because this is a high visibility area, I wiped off any excess PVC cement purely for aesthetics. Continue to glue everything together, but before making the final connection, you wanna make sure that you thread your cable through the conduit and into the shed as you're seeing now before you make that final connection. So as you can see, I have the cable threaded through and now I'm gluing that final connection 12 inches below grade. And now I'm just going to apply a little bit of construction adhesive to the back of the fitting there, and then I'm gonna permanently insert it into the shed and press it into place. Then I took a little bit of clear caulk and I sealed around the perimeter of that fitting to prevent any water from ever getting behind. Then I took a conduit clip and I permanently attached it to the shed to hold it in place. Now, here's a look at the entire run going from the house to the GFCI outlet that we installed, down below grade, and then following the conduit routing underground and to the shed. So at this point, we're gonna be doing some work on the inside of the shed, and the first order of business was to install an outlet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the power feed cable that's coming in at the bottom there, and I'm gonna route it through that receptacle box, and I'm gonna install an outlet there. Next, I'm going to take the power cable from the outlet box and I'm going to install some exterior switches. And right now I'm just marking the outline of that receptacle box. Then I took an oscillating tool and I cut out around the outline. I continued using an oscillating tool until I cut all the way around the outline on the siding. And then I installed the receptacle box as shown using some mounting screws on the inside to attach it to the blocking I installed previously. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna take our incoming power supply, we're gonna route it into that outlet receptacle box, and as you can see, I'm gonna wire that outlet in place, and then we have the outgoing wire from the outlet receptacle box to the switch box. So I installed two switches there, but we'll get to that later. Next, let's install some side lights on the shed. I installed my lights on the side of the shed and I centered them between the windows. I used a hole saw bit to cut a hole perfectly sized for a new work electrical box as you're seeing here. And then I adjusted that and installed it between the studs as you're seeing now. Then make adjustments as needed to get it centered within the hole you drilled and then tighten it down once the location is finalized. Next, feed your electrical cable through the box and make sure you have enough slack to get back to the power source. Here are the lights we're gonna be installing. I bought them on Amazon and I'll link them in the description. Then wire the light up based on the manufacturer's instructions. After wiring the light, I used some clear caulk to make sure that the area around the light was completely waterproof. So at this point, we need to connect the shed light wire that's going to the receptacle box at the light to the receptacle box for the light switch and power. So to get through the studs, I'm drilling small holes about half an inch through the studs with a little drill bit right there. And once we route that through, we can take the power cable and feed it into our switch box. On the outside of the shed, here's a look at me routing that through. You can see the power's coming in the bottom, and there is gonna be the switch wire, which is going to the side light of the shed. And I'm repeating this process for the second light, that is drilling holes through the studs and routing the electrical cable from the light all the way around, as you're seeing now, to the power supply on the opposite side of the shed. So here's the routing, we're going above the roll-up door, and then we're going down to the actual power feed. I then installed some decorative lights on the front of the shed the exact same way that I installed the lights on the side. I then routed the electrical cable from those lights to the incoming power supply with the exterior switches. I wired two light switches on the shed's exterior. One light switch controls the two exterior lights on the sides of the shed, and the other switch controls the decorative lights on the front of the shed. I also installed an overhead bay light on the inside of the shed. After confirming that everything was working and after getting the thumbs up from my electrician, I went and I backfilled everything along the entire conduit run. And there was one segment right here where I wasn't able to get the 12 inch depth that I needed per code. So I installed some concrete and this is gonna prevent anyone from digging this area, accidentally damaging the electrical cable. Lastly, I planted some grass seed over the soil that I used to backfill the conduit routing area. And the grass turned out pretty good. I'll link that video on growing grass in case you're interested. Here's a look at the electricity added to my shed.
What's up everybody? On today's project, we're gonna take this shed right here and turn it into this. Let's get into the video. What's going on everybody? So here's a look at my shed before it got organized and honestly, this looks like most sheds that I've seen recently, just kind of cluttered and not having the space optimized. So I took everything out of the shed so I could start from scratch. Now there are a ton of shed organization systems out there, but when researching everything online, I came across a product called ProSlat, which is basically an advanced French cleat style system that has a wide variety of accessories that you simply clip into the wall and it makes it really easy to hang up all of your tools in an organized manner. So after deciding that I actually wanted to install ProSlat, I reached out to the company and we decided that something called a Procore slat wall, which has an aluminum core strip in the back, will give me up to 200 pounds per square foot of hold, which seemed like the best solution for my shed. Now let's install it. Now the first step in installing any Pro Slat product is to start with the horizontal starter trim at the base of your installation. I installed my starter trim at the floor, but you can start yours at any height you want. Install the provided screws at each stud except for the two outermost studs. Because of the outermost studs, you're going to take your vertical J trim and you're going to tuck it behind the starter trim and put one screw through both to hold them in place. Repeat this for both sides. Next, you're going to install the first Pro Slat panel, and to do this, you're going to slide both edges into the vertical J trim and slide it down so you can tuck it into the starter trim at the bottom. Here you can see that I've slid it all the way down through the vertical J trim, and I have the bottom of that first panel tucked into the starter trim. After installing the first panel and ensuring that it's level all the way across, you're going to use the provided self-tapping metal screws to secure the panel to each stud. So here I am installing screws through the first panel, and if you ever use self-tapping metal screws, you know that it requires a little bit of elbow grease to actually get those screws set. And as you install subsequent panels, you're gonna hear an audible click that indicates that the panels are interlocked correctly. Here's a look at me marking the outline for an outlet, and then I'm gonna cut this out so that we can actually access the receptacle behind the slat wall. I'll show you how to cut that out a little bit later on in the video. I then just had to move the receptacle forward so it's flush with the slat wall. After installing the first four foot by eight foot segment of slat wall, I moved on to another wall and I did the starter trim at the bottom, the vertical J trims on the side, and then slid all the panels into place, securing them with the self-tapping screws into each stud. Also, I ran electricity in my shed, so if you have electrical, make sure you're using nail plates to protect the wires from any of the pro slat screws. Now at this point, I moved on to the third wall of my shed, which was the last wall where I could install a full eight foot length of the pro slat slat wall. Just like before, I'm taking the starter trim at the bottom and I'm securing it to each stud along the bottom plate using the provided screws. After attaching the starter trim, I took my vertical pieces of J trim and I tucked it behind the starter trim just like we did before. This process is pretty redundant, but I wanted to show a couple different angles for clarity. You might also find it helpful to actually secure the vertical piece of J trim at the top, at least temporarily, while you install your panels. Now, although I installed the standard J trim in the corner, I installed something called H trim on the right hand side because I'm gonna connect another segment of Pro Slat slat wall to the other side. This H trim will allow you to keep a continuous run that's longer than eight feet in length. So just like before, I'm sliding the slat wall panels down into the J trim on one side and then the H trim on the other side. Again, that H trim is gonna be filled in on the opposite side with smaller segments later on. Tuck it into place and make sure that you have the bottom of the panel tucked into the starter trim at the bottom as shown. After installing the first panel and confirming level, use the provided hardware to screw the slat wall into each stud as shown. Slide the next panel down into place and make sure it interlocks properly. After confirming proper interlock, take the provided screws and you're going to go through the Procore panel as I'm showing right there, securing it to the stud behind and also securing the J trim in the process. So at this point, I've installed all of the eight foot full segments of Pro Slat. Now it's time to go back and install the partial segments. So what you're going to do is you're going to trim your bottom J trim to size using snippers. As you can see, we have this corner here. So I cut one corner and then cut the other size of J trim to fit within. And then what you're going to do after you get the base trim positioned is you want to measure the actual length for the pro slat panel. And in this case, it was right around 16 and a quarter inches. So I set up a stop block on my miter saw so that all of the lengths would be the exact same and I wouldn't have to measure each time. And after establishing that stop block where it needed to be, I cut all of the smaller pro slat panels to length. After cutting all of the pro slat panels to size, I took it back inside and I confirmed fit by tucking it into the piece of trim on the left hand side and pushing it up against the stud on the right hand side. Because that back right corner is going to be covered by the perpendicular piece of pro slat, I didn't use a piece of trim on the right hand side. 
I then secured it to the studs after tucking the bottom of that piece of panel into the J trim at the base. Then, just like before, you're going to slide each individual panel into place, making sure that it interlocks properly with the piece installed previously, and then secure it to each stud. So after completing this small segment, I needed to install a longer segment that would go across the window and around a receptacle box. For segments like this, you might find yourself in a position where you need to cut out segments of the pro slat panel. And to do this, I used a clamp to hold the panel in place. And then I used a jigsaw to cut through the aluminum cavity and through that one segment of the PVC panel. I found that using snippers worked a lot better than the actual jigsaw for this. And you can also remove parts of the aluminum cavity if that's gonna help you to access your cut location. So here you can see I'm cleaning up that cut with snippers and then I'm moving on to cut out the window right here. And as you can see again, I cut that out with a jigsaw, removed the aluminum cavity, and then I cut out the bottom segment using snippers. All right, so we got it in place. You can see right there, we cut around the window. And then again, we cut around that box there. So for the most professional look possible, you're gonna wanna take some partial segments of J trim and you're gonna wanna trim around the window. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna cover up any sharp edges from your cuts on the pro slide panel. So I just installed that one piece of J trim on the side. Now I'm installing that piece of J trim on the bottom and you're gonna have to do this for all sides of the window. So after installing it on the bottom and the sides, I went and I installed the remaining pieces of panel and then I secured it to the studs as you're seeing now. And then you're basically just gonna kind of frame around the window, installing the J trim at the top once you get to that part. And as you can see, I'm installing it right there. All right, so we got this wall done. We had that window trimmed in okay. And now we're just gonna fill in this last little spot. We'll go ahead and get our measurement across and then set up a stop block on the saw. So just like before, we set up a stop block for the saw and cut all of these smaller panels to length. And then it's just like you would for the eight foot panels. You would slide down that panel in between the H trim on the right and the J trim on the left, and then secure it using the provided screws into each stud. Here I am showing how I position the J trim around the second window, and here's a quick time lapse of me finalizing the Procore Pro Slat Slat Wall installation on the side wall of the shed. Lastly, I went back and I filled in the smaller segments at the front wall of the shed, and I installed the starter trim and the vertical J trims just like we did before, and you can see there's a receptacle box right there that I cut out using snippers. I then secured the final panels in place using the provided screws and mounting the panels to the studs behind. And when you get to the final piece, you want to install a piece of top trim to give you a nice professional look all the way across. Since the side walls of the shed are sloped to match the roof pitch, instead of using top trim and cutting the panels at an angle, I just did staggered cuts and I used something called reno board to give the area at the top a professional finished look. And as you can see here, I used top trim at the back wall of the shed. And here's a look at the inside of the shed with all of the Procore panels installed on each side. Now it's finally time to install accessories and get this shed organized. And after taking a quick look at the ProSlat website, I'm convinced they make an accessory for literally anything you would ever need to hang in your shed. So at this point, I took the accessories and I started clipping them into my Procore wall. To install the accessories, tip it into place at the top and use the dial at the bottom to hold it in place. Then hang up all your tools. Positioning the accessories and getting all of my tools and items organized was definitely the fun part of this project. And ProSlat also makes something called a Pro Rack, which me and my brother are installing right there. The Pro Rack has hooks on the bottom where you can hang up things like bikes, and there's also a shelf for storage on top. Overall, I'm super happy with the Pro Slap product. I think it looks incredible, and it makes it so easy to optimize every square foot of your shed's wall space. I will say this is considered more of a premium product and it is a little bit pricey. So I reached out to ProSlat and they are able to provide a 10% discount to my viewers by using code andrewthrown 10 which you can check out in the description. Now, let's take a look at how the shed looked before. And here's a look at the final result. What's going on everybody? On today's project, we're gonna take this basic shed subfloor and we're gonna spice it up, turning it into this. This video is gonna be pretty detailed. It'll show you how to fill the gaps in between the plywood, how to mix up and apply the flexible primer, how to saturate the pigments and apply your epoxy top coat, and finally, how to apply polyurethane for a durable finish that's gonna last a long time. So if you need to skip around, use the chapter markers at the bottom of the video, but without wasting any more time, let's get going.
So here's a quick look at the shed's plywood subfloor before we did any work to it. So as you can see, it's a little bit dirty, it's very unimpressive, and it's very common for what you'd expect to see in a shed. So the first thing I did here is I just swept up all the dirt and debris and made sure that there was gonna be nothing that was gonna impact the application of our epoxy later. Next up, you wanna make sure that you don't have any screws or nails that are sticking up that are gonna impact the application of epoxy. So use a putty knife to see if anything is protruding up, and if it is, go ahead and use a drill or a hammer to make sure that you sink it below the plywood subfloor deck. Repeat this process over the whole shed plywood subfloor area. Finally, I grabbed the vacuum and I vacuumed the entire shed subfloor. Now, although I'm applying an epoxy floor coating in the 10 by 10 shed you're seeing now, you can apply this for any plywood subfloor, whether that be in a bathroom, in a home, in a basement, any of it. But while we're on the subject, if you wanna learn how to build this shed from start to finish, you can check out my links in the description. After preparing your plywood subfloor, the next step is to pick the right epoxy flooring system for your application area. There are a bunch of different epoxy flooring manufacturers out there. Some of the big ones are Spartan Epoxies, uh, Ligari, Rust-Oleum makes some, I think. But basically, spend some time researching what manufacturer is going to be best for you. I went with Spartan Epoxies, and honestly, they were phenomenal to deal with, and the product was spot on. All of the Spartan Epoxy products I used are linked in the video description. Next up, you need to decide on what epoxy flooring look you're going for. There are two main epoxy styles. One is a metallic look and the other is the flake look. For my epoxy flooring, I went with the metallic system, hashtag flake free, but the steps to apply the epoxy is pretty similar for both styles. Now, the first step in actually applying the epoxy to your shed subfloor is to apply a crack filler product to all of the gaps in the plywood subfloor. You're also going to fill in the screw heads. So right here, I'm taking the part A of the CF100 product from Spartan Epoxies, and I'm putting that in a mixing bucket. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the part B component and you're gonna mix equal parts A and B in that mixing bucket. And uh, I'm using literally just a paint stirrer to combine that and mix it all together. You wanna make sure that you add the right ratio according to the manufacturer's instructions, and you also wanna mix this crack filler up according to the manufacturer's instructions. Now, once you've mixed the part A and part B of the CF100 crack repair product together, it'll be kind of this putty. And you're gonna take a putty knife and you're gonna apply that product to every joint in between the pieces of plywood subfloor and also on top of the screw heads. Let's start by filling in the joints between the plywood and then we'll go back and do the screw heads. So as you can see, I'm taking the putty knife and I'm filling in the gaps between the pieces of plywood subfloor. If you have large gaps, you're gonna obviously need more of the crack filler product to actually fill that in. But in my case here, the gaps weren't too major, so usually one pass was enough to fill that gap completely. As you can see, I'm being pretty liberal with the first pass just to make sure that I get enough crack filler to actually fill that gap. And then I'm going back later on and I'm wiping off all the excess. Now, this doesn't need to be perfect. The big takeaway is that you don't wanna have big globs that are sticking up and drying. So try to make sure that you have it pretty flush with the plywood. I also went back and I applied crack filler to any large knots in the wood and then also above any screw holes. So take a few minutes to apply the crack filler product to all of the seams between plywood and also to cover all of the large knots and screw heads. You wanna to try to seal up all the screw heads and the voids and the gaps between the plywood now so it doesn't introduce issues when you go to apply the epoxy later. So here's a quick look at the crack filler after it dried. And once we were okay with how everything looked, I applied some painter's tape to the bottom of the wall around the entire perimeter of the shed. The idea here is this will prevent any epoxy coating from getting on the shed walls when we move on to the subsequent steps. I think it's well worth the time to take care of this right now. After applying painter's tape to the perimeter of the shed walls, the next step is to apply our first coating of epoxy. In this case, it's the Flexible Epoxy Primer, which in this case is the Flex System by Spartan Epoxies. So to apply this, we're gonna mix it up and then we're gonna apply it to the subfloor using an eight to 12 WFT mill notched squeegee, and then we'll apply it with a 3 16 inch nap roller. You're also gonna want some gunite shoes, which will allow you to walk across the epoxy without messing it up. They'll also give you a leg up in your next street fight. So just like most epoxy products, we're gonna mix the part A and part B in equal parts in a five gallon bucket using the mixer attachment on our drill. Now for substrates like plywood, it's often a good idea to apply a flexible primer like Flex. 
because these wood subfloors will experience a lot more elongation and warpage and shrinkage over time. And you wanna apply kind of a rubberized coating that will stretch and contract and shrink with the elongation and the shrinkage and expansion with that plywood. So this is basically like a rubberized coating, which is gonna flex along with the plywood. So mix up the part A and part B of the flex product within the bucket according to the manufacturer's instructions. And a pro tip is to keep the mixer submerged the entire time while you mix. This will prevent air from getting in and creating bubbles in the flex product. Then what I did is I took my five gallon bucket of mixed flex product and I spread it out all over the plywood subfloor with my notched squeegee. You're just gonna push it back and forth, make sure you get it in all the corners and you can use a paintbrush to get in the hard to reach places like the inside corners of the back wall there. So continue to spread out the flex epoxy product over the entire shed's plywood subfloor. This process is pretty fun. I recommend that you actually start in the back of the shed and work your way out. That way you don't need to put on the gunite shoes or cleats that will allow you to actually walk on top of the surface. Continue to apply the flex product as needed until you've covered the entire shed subfloor area. Be careful that you don't get too reckless and get it on the walls or on the shed ramp and make sure you stay within the bounds of your taped off area. So after using the notch squeegee and notching out the flex across the entire shed subfloor, it's time to put on those gunite shoes or cleats, take your 3 16 inch nap roller, and now you're gonna go back and you're gonna roll the entire area to get a nice uniform layer of flex product across the entire shed subfloor. Again, I started in the back and I worked my way out. After rolling the flex product, allow it to dry according to the manufacturer's instructions. In my case, this was about 24 hours. Here's a look at the product after it dried. So after applying flex, the next step is to apply a waterborne epoxy primer. For the Spartan epoxy system, this is the HDWB product. And again, you're gonna mix part A with part B in a mixing bucket. And this time I just used a hand mixer, just a painting mixer stick to mix that up. And Something I want to note is that this primer is typically the first step if you're applying epoxy on you know, a concrete subfloor like a garage, but because we're doing ours on subfloor, this step was preceded by the flex application since that's going to give us more elongation. So after mixing up this waterborne epoxy primer, we're going to take a 3 8 inch nap roller, and as you can see, I brought out the big guy for this and we're gonna roll this primer all over the flex product. So as you can see here, I'm simply rolling the primer over the flex product that we applied previously. There's no real rocket science here. It's just a matter of getting the primer applied to the entire floor area. So as you can see, I went back and forth. I tried to get as close to the corners as I could with the roller, but you're not gonna be able to get all the way into the inside of the corner. You can get close, but you're gonna to need to do some touch up work over there. You may need to use a paintbrush to get inside the corners. And as you can see here, I'm going in the inside corners and I'm also gonna go around the roll-up door and the front of the shed near the ramp to make sure that we apply this epoxy primer over the entire surface of the floor. So after using a paintbrush to reach all the hard to reach places on the inside corners and around the roll-up door, I took my nap roller and I completed the application of the primer over the rest of the application area. After finishing up, I closed the roll-up door to prevent anything from blowing in and disturbing the application. Now, while we wait for the epoxy primer to dry, we're gonna go ahead and mix up our metallic epoxy pigments and allow them to saturate in the epoxy overnight. Okay, so to install this, what we're gonna do, we have a three gallon kit right here, and then we have a one gallon kit right here. The general rule of thumb is four ounces of pigment. This is a four ounce right here per gallon of part A. So we're gonna take four ounces and eight ounces of this for 12 ounces to go into our part A here. This is gonna give us kind of a white um, base coat. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put about four ounces of this dolphin in the uh, smaller one gallon can. So we'll mix all that up and we'll go from there. You can either mix with your mixer right here or what we're gonna do is just mix this up with uh, these sticks. Let's get into it. So this is the Clear 100 Epoxy Part A that we're gonna mix our pigments into. So we're gonna open that up. That's three gallons right there. Here's what we're looking at, just completely plain. Now we'll go ahead and add our pigments. 
So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and put eight ounces of this great white pigment into the part A epoxy. And then we're gonna put in an additional four ounces of pearl. Now you can see here that I have a shop vac close by and the idea is that the shop vac will suck up any of the pigment powder that ends up escaping instead of it going up in my face and me potentially breathing it in. And I'm also wearing a respirator right now for protection as well. So continue to mix in all the pigments. You wanna mix until it's completely homogenous and there's no streaks in it. So this can take a few minutes, but we eventually got there. So once your Clear 100 Part A epoxy has no more streaks in it and the pigment is fully dissolved throughout, you're gonna go ahead and close it up and let it sit overnight until we actually mix it with the Part B. So seal that up and now we'll move on and actually mix up our darker pigment. So here is just one gallon, so we're gonna open that up. This is again the Clear 100 Part A and we're gonna mix in four ounces of pigment. We're gonna do three ounces of dolphin and about one ounce of manatee. So as you can see, just as before, we're taking the pigments and we're gonna apply it to the part A and we're gonna slowly stir it in before we add all four ounces. So I stirred in about two ounces, stirred it up for a minute, and then I stirred in the remaining two ounces to give us four ounces total dissolved in the one gallon of the part A clear 100. Once this was done, we sealed this back up just like we did for the three gallon bucket and we're gonna give it around 12 hours for the pigments to saturate overnight. Okay, so it's the next day. We have our part A that we pre-mixed, our part B that we're gonna mix in, and then for the smaller one, we have our part A and our part B. Again, this is kind of the darker metallic and this is a lighter white. So we'll mix it up. So at this point, we're gonna take our part A and our part B for both the larger three gallon and the smaller one gallon clear 100 part A's, and then we're gonna mix it together. So here we are opening up the three gallon and opening up the one gallon of part B, and then we're mixing it together with the mixer attachment for my drill. You're gonna mix this according to the manufacturer's instructions. You can see that I gradually poured all the part B in just to make sure that I got a thorough mix. And you're gonna mix this up again for the duration specified by the epoxy manufacturer. Again, you wanna keep the mixer submerged during the entire mixing process to avoid air entrainment into the mixture. This is gonna prevent you from having a bunch of air bubbles when you go to apply this epoxy later. So after mixing up the three gallons of the lighter epoxy, I moved on to the one gallon of the darker epoxy. So as you can see, I'm mixing the part B with the part A right there, and we're gonna mix it up with the mixer attachment on my drill, the same way we did for the three gallon. So mix this up according to the manufacturer's instructions, and once we finish mixing, we can start the application process. Now, there are a ton of different ways to actually apply epoxy depending on the look you're going for. In my case, I took my three gallons of the lighter pigment epoxy mixture and I dumped it all over the floor. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create something called a slick coat, which is where I'm gonna apply one continuous coat across the entire application area. So as you can see, I'm using a flat squeegee to spread that epoxy around in a thin uniform layer across the entire application area on my shed's floor. And as you can see, I'm wearing those gunite shoes so I can walk freely across the entire floor area without worrying about where I step. And then I'm just going back and forth, applying a slick coat of the lighter epoxy to the entire application area. It took a little bit of precision to get around the roll-up door and in the corners there, but with enough patience, I was able to get a nice thin uniform coat across the entire area. After thoroughly spreading out the slick coat with the squeegee, I took a 3 8 inch nap roller and I rolled the entire application area to give myself a nice uniform slick coat across the entire floor. I used a nine inch roller to get on the inside corners in those hard to reach places against the wall. And I used an 18 inch roller for the middle of the shed just to make things go faster. This rolling process is gonna make sure that you have a uniform layer across the entire epoxy application area. Continue to roll the slick coat of epoxy until you have a nice uniform layer throughout. After applying your slick coat, you're gonna apply your accent epoxy. In this case, this is the darker metallic epoxy, and we're gonna apply this in small puddles or ribbons across the floor. So continue to apply the accent color. In our case, this is the metallic silver, and I recommend that you continue to pour small ribbons and don't overdo it. Less is more to start, and you can always add more later. 
After applying enough of this accent epoxy for my liking, what I did is I grabbed a nine inch roller. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically just swirl the accent color into the slick coat. And this is gonna give us a nice kind of metallic look that's blended together, which in my opinion, looks pretty cool. Continue to blend in the accent color of epoxy with the slick coat, and you can basically just blend in this circular motion that you're seeing now. And what you can do is you can dip the roller in the dark accent color and then move it to an area that didn't receive any accent color to give you kind of a blended color. The more that you blend and the more that you swirl, the more the two colors will mix together, creating one uniform color. So less is more if you wanna have distinct color differences and if you want it to be more blended, obviously continue to swirl like crazy. Now I'm gonna let the time lapse roll out of me actually swirling in the accent color into the slick coat. And I wanna note that there really are countless design styles and ways that you can apply epoxy to get specific looks. Because of the look I was going for, it made sense to do that lighter slick coat and then blend in the darker accent epoxy in this swirling method with a roller. However, if you're going for a different look, spend some time on the internet. There's so many tutorials out there that will show you the exact epoxy application and installation procedure to get the look that you're going for. So here I am doing the final touches. I'm swirling in the last few segments of the accent color, and now I'm just cleaning up around the perimeter near the door. So here's a quick look at the shed floor immediately after I finished swirling in the accent color. Now I'm just gonna let it cure overnight. Now what I'm showing here is there were a few air bubbles that formed near the front entrance of the shed. And to get rid of those, I used a blowtorch and I brought the heat within a reasonable distance to those air bubbles causing them to pop. You can achieve a similar result with a heat gun. Now here's a quick look at the epoxy floor 48 hours after applying our epoxy. Now at this point, you technically could be done with your project. However, I wanted to apply a protective urethane top coat just to make sure that this epoxy coating was gonna last for a long time. Now, if I would have installed this top coat within 12 hours of applying the epoxy, I wouldn't have had to go back and sand this entire area with a 120 grit sanding screen but because I waited too long, I had to go back and rough up the surface. In order to ensure that the HPU top coat of urethane that I'm gonna apply next would adhere properly to the epoxy coat beneath. Then I went back and I vacuumed up all of the sanding dust that I created. Now, just like all the rest of the products, this is a part A, part B system. So I'm opening up the part A's right there, and then I'm gonna mix in the part B's as you're seeing. Once I mix the part B into the part A, I'm gonna go with my mixing stirrer and mix up the product in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Then we're gonna transfer the urethane top coat to a paint tray, and then we're gonna apply it to the entire shed floor using a nap roller. In this case, we're using a nine inch roller with a three eighths inch nap, and we're just gonna roll this urethane top coat across the entire application area. You may find that a paintbrush is useful in cutting in the inside corners if you can't reach those hard to reach places with a roller. But at this point, it's simply a matter of getting full coverage of the HPU urethane top coat product over the entire floor. I will note that this stuff is pretty potent. It smells, uh, it smells impressive. So you wanna make sure that you have windows open. I would recommend that you wear a respirator when applying this product and keep the windows open and the door open for I would say 12 to 24 hours after you apply this product to get all those fumes out. So here I am continuing to roll and working my way out of the shed and I'm doing the final coat right there on the shed entrance. After applying the HPU coat, I closed the door and I allowed it to dry. The next day I came in and I removed that strip of painter's tape around the perimeter. I found that using a utility knife to score along the epoxy surface made it easier to remove since part of the painter's tape actually got embedded beneath the epoxy. So as you can see there, I'm just scoring that line and then peeling the tape off. So continue to remove the tape around the entire shed perimeter. Now at this point, you've successfully applied epoxy to a plywood subfloor. Let's take a quick reminder look at what this floor used to look like. And now here's a look at the final result.
Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and it helped you out, I really would appreciate if you could drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel for more DIY content like this. Thanks, and I'll see you on the next one.